Uh, Assalamu alaikum everyone. We're uh, joined today by the one and only, the bane of uh, liberal society in Pakistan, uh, Raja Ziaul Haq. Uh, we'll figure out the, where the name comes from eventually. Yeah. But uh, for now, I'm sure you all know Raja Bhai. And we're also joined today by the one and only, uh, Muhammad Hijab. Uh, I think uh, I think you wanted to see the mainland after Englistan. You wanted to see the actual. <laughs> <laughs> What's your, all the fuss was about? What the fuss was about? <laughs> yeah. uh, welcome home, as you would say. Mm-hmm. Uh, considering that you're coming up from the outward most province of Pakistan, the UK, <laughs> uh, Muhammad Hijab, a renowned public speaker, debater, philosopher. Uh, Controversial figure. Controversial <laughs> figure. That's how I describe my brother. Um, how's it hanging? Uh, we were getting, a, I was personally getting an ASMR experience from Hijab, mashallah, reciting the Quran. And uh, the conversation had started off on uh, the Geem in Egyptian Arabic, which is the equivalent of the Jeem, which is also in Urdu. Uh, speaking of uh, idiosyncrasies in, in cultures and language, uh, Pakistan, how are you finding in Hijab? I like it. I mean, I'm used to a lot of it and I can expect because in Egypt, obviously where I'm originally from, you know, Cairo and Karachi are very similar cities, you know, I think so. Aesthetically and infrastructurally. Right. Um, so when I went and saw Karachi for the first time, it was not like something I haven't seen before. It was the same kind of vibe as I had seen. Mm. Mm. So it was uh, interesting to sort see. Sort of a tight urban sprawl and... Yeah, exactly that. Right, exactly. it was very nice. Um, but surely there's something beyond just the, the casual tourism that maybe you're enjoying. What do you think has driven you to Pakistan other than the fact that you wanted to see where the doctors come from? Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I think is, um, if, if you think about the strength of the Muslim world objectively, and if you did an analysis on the, you know, the Muslim countries, I think it's only fair to say that objectively Pakistan is the strongest Muslim country in the world. Right. Now, there are contenders to that. I mean, I'm not going to lie to you. I think maybe a contender, if you, if you count it, is Iran. Right. So, so, true contender. You could say Turkey is a contender. I would say Egypt's a contender as well, even though it's a lesser contender than the other two that I've just mentioned. Um, however, you've got nuclear weapons, you've got a 250 million population. You have a melting pot of different civilizations and cultures and tribes. You have a geopolitical location, which is undoubtedly uh, important and out of the reach now of the Western powers. Um, in fact, there are no bases here, military bases. Not anymore. Not anymore. I think the last one in 2014 mm. was the last one from what I remember, but when they were driven out of this yes. country. And obviously there are no bases in Iran, and there are no bases in Afghanistan. So they've, the West and America in particular have lost, they have lost... Um, Their foothold in the region, you think? Yeah, the power in that region, geopolitically. So Pakistan definitely is one of those countries which I would say, if we can affect change in a country like this, we can affect change in the quickest and most efficient way in the entire Muslim world. That's a, that's a very strategic way to think about the Ummah and the state of the Ummah right now. Um, it, again, we live in the context of a post 9-11 reality yeah. and uh, the, the global war on terror that the US uh, was primarily the target was the Muslim world. And it's very fascinating to note that now that influence and that sphere of influence has been shrinking, uh, perhaps on purpose as a strategic retreat that the US is sort of giving away its uh, number one position as the hegemon of the uh, of the world, um, you see the last vestiges of American influence within the region, primarily in Pakistan, compared to Iran. Military vestiges, uh, if you like, not mm-hmm. ideological vestiges. On some level, I'm going to have to say ideological as well, because in some segments of Pakistani society, you do have that sure. um, uh, uh, Eurocentric or, or, or yeah, or, that's or, what I mean, yeah. Yeah, so that, that sort of Western aligned, uh, mm. you know, appreciation for neoliberal democracy, for capitalism yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and for the UN. So, so it still exists. It still exists. Yeah, yeah. And I think Pakistan is the last holdout in, in this region. Yeah. Uh, perhaps because of the uh, the cultural interplay that we've had in the past 30, 40 years with America and, the West, and Western Europe 
in general uh, on an edu- on on the level of education cultural exchange you know dietary patterns music netflix you name it you know the whole the whole nine yards um but it's very good that we're having this sort of cross cultural and you're an egyptian and you're in the uk you ex- you represent that sort of um diaspora muslim community that lives all over western europe and in america and canada in the broader sense and it's uh, it's very nice of the youth club to be able to organize this and have you come over and they've already had people like hamza sortsis and 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 uh imran uh, imran hussain imran hussain brother yeah, imran hussain there's subur ahmed coming in right. uh, adnan rashid from the uk again and uh, also we've had now brother fahad taslim coming from the us so yeah it's been a good uh, mix of and, and they've been and they've been fantastic hosts i have to say and very organized and very proud of youth club and what they've been able to achieve uh, all across pakistan uh raj is a very likable person and i think the entire team is composed of very no, competent I, and likable people I, I, I'm, so i'm i'm glad that very the, proud to be in uh, in partnership with people like this i'm glad that that you've endorsed the the youth club and you've given them their stamp of approval yes. um <laughs> so you can have to repeat what you were saying. Yeah, I mean they don't need my endorsement. Um there are people who are firmly established in the country and um yes. And the work it speaks for itself really. Yes. Alhamdulillah. Um you see a lot of influence in 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 of Pakistan in the mainstream uh of the Muslim world. Uh although albeit it's been waning since Pakistan has become increasingly economically weaker. Mm. Um and perhaps zaab bhai can speak more to that uh zaab bhai what do you think or you hope to achieve with people like mohammad jab coming in experts of you know polemics and, and the philosophical discussions around islam and the belief in god what do you think is the is is the end goal here with the the youth of pakistan and what do you hope to achieve with these sort of cross cultural uh, communications that you're uh, in- conducting uh aman bhai uh, we are as you all know we are suffering from the gora complex So in order to fight off the Gora complex and try to tell people that you know we have people uh, who are academics in the Muslim world so brother Hijab is a perfect uh, case for that he's uh, dealing with the Arkonolian masters uh, in the form of you know debating them uh, and refuting them at, at Hyde having, Park at Hyde Park <laughs> at, at Oxford at different universities right. uh, all across the UK even in the US and Canada so he's alhamdulillah he's one of those people who has been there done that he's heard all the arguments he's all heard all the uh, possible claims that could be made uh, as a case for liberalism or for secularism uh, so when he, a person like him comes to pakistan i think that gives us a new flavor a different kind of vibe and especially when we take him to some of the more prestigious universities across pakistan i think uh, that really helps to create a narrative and to make us feel comfortable with our religion to make us realize that you know islam is something that is the truth with a capital t and it's time that we accept it we adopt it and we inshallah uh, teach it to those around us and we take ownership of our tradition absolutely right um you've been around uh, and seen some of the universities in pakistan how is the as a temperature test how are the students what were they like uh, you know how did you find them i mean the vast majority of them i would say definitely are um very very impressive they are more than bilingual they have good skills uh, you can see that they're trying really hard they take education seriously i think there is a culture in pakistan and the subcontinent generally that there's a culture of education um people take the education very seriously so these are good points um there was religious crowds and of course i did interact with some secular and liberal crowds but i think they were l- triggered by my presence what i had to bring and i think more and more of these universities will feel the same way but that's exactly what they need to be if they claim to be critical and open minded so they also have to be open minded to the idea that traditional islam is the truth and they have to be critical of the ideas of liberalism and feminism and secularism and atheism or whatever maybe a combination of these things so that's what i'm trying to do i'm trying to plant seeds in their minds of criticality so that they can take it back uh to uh, you know their own respective world views that they've adopted and swallowed from the west um and they can then start questioning those in the same way that they did with islam in the first instance that's a very beautiful thing for you to say in that kid that they need to be able to uh critique their own perhaps um 
beliefs and whatever they're standing on because there is there is a tendency to to turn towards a tribalism and mm-hmm. i'm sure you're fully aware of the the tribalism considering that you've been involved in polemics uh with regards to world views and beliefs that people hold and i think pakistan in the muslim world is uniquely positioned in the sense that you've also experienced this here uh seeing that you've been all over the muslim world that there is an openness in pakistani society in terms of the 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 uh the conversations that they're willing to have even behind closed doors and, and in public as well uh with regards to religion philosophy the way the world ought to be you know so yeah, that, that was a surprising point to be fair like how you could do dawah in pakistan no problem it's yes. you you have a degree of free speech which uh people would be surprised to i mean compare it with other countries in the muslim and arab world there is actually no comparison whatsoever so it's a great blessing and an excellent opportunity for people to do dawah and to promulgate the message of islam no alhamdulillah that's uh, it's it's very positive because we've always sort of known this uh, mm. on some level in pakistan but i think the fact that you've come and reaffirmed this is a, is, a, is, a, is is important because uh, people tend to forget that you know there's a, there's a few hundred countries in the world and mm. and the way they're socially organized and politically organized perhaps wouldn't be as free or relatively less free than what pakistan uh has achieved with all of its failures mm. um right the, the the any conversation about the state of the umma about islam about the strength of islam would be remiss without the current situation in uh, gaza and you've uh, been fairly active on the international scene uh, i think your two peers morgan interviews one where there was a one to one interview and the one where you debated uh, rabbi shmuli <laughs> uh what was the name that you guys gave him Unholy Shmoli. Unholy Shmoli, yeah. <laughs> um, in review, again, I don't know the 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 amount that they were viewed in Pakistan, but I'm sure they were pretty viral, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, they were they were fairly well watched in Pakistan. Uh, when you when when confronting someone like Piers Morgan, right, clearly has an implicit bias for Zionism or for the state of Israel or for let's call it European foreign policy. Um, what sort of what sort of ideas do you bring to the table and what sort of mindset do you bring when debating or discussing with somebody like that and in retrospect do you find that there were weaknesses to your argument to your case and you feel like oh maybe i should have said this or maybe i shouldn't have said that or do you feel like you've done your job adequately with regards to the first debate the first conversation well i mean any debate or discussion i break it down into three different things okay i break it down into arguments strategies and tactics Okay and strategies and tactics are different. Uh, von Bismarck military strategist he he um qualified the difference between stratagem and tactics in so much as he said that strategies are the what you're trying to achieve and tactics are the things you do in order to achieve them. Right. So let me give you an example, right? Uh let's say for example someone's boxing. Okay? in a boxing environment. So someone can have a general counterattack strategy. Many people have like Floyd Mayweather, great boxer, okay. He has a counterattack. What that means is he waits for the opponent to hit first. And then as he's hitting or after he's done his attack, he hits straight afterwards because the point at which you are most susceptible to being attacked is the point at which you are attacking yourself that's a principle effectively right and so a counterattack strategy waits for the opponent to make the move now the thing about a strategy is that you're doing it throughout the thing now this works in boxing it works in kickboxing it works in MMA but it also works in debating mm it works in it works in military warfare you wait for the opponent to make the first move then you strike So this is called you could call it a general counterattack strategy. This is something I employed because for example in the interviewer interview dynamic it's you cannot ask questions to someone whose show it is. Right. Okay. So the best strategy for a situation like that is the counterattack strategy. Hmm. Right? So tactics are different now. Tactics is how you throw your punches. So Floyd Mayweather might decide to throw when the right hand comes to him he throws a check left hook for example or he might decide to go down and throw a, a sneaky uppercut or he might decide to go you know a jab and then a left hook these are all tactics it's how you implement your strategy 
And so that's where the controversies may be. Like, for example, <coughs> some tactics, people don't like them. People don't appreciate them. But they can be very sticky and they can be very memorable and they can be very effective. For example, ad hominem strategy. It's, I think you employed that with, with the second one. Unholy right? shmoli. Uh, yeah. So some people don't like that. You're always going to lose ground to gain it sometimes with these mm. things. Um, because these, these concessions are for public consumption at the end of the day. Yeah, they are for public consumption. And so the question is, how do you make your impression on the public? Do you see what I mean? Like, you tell them about unholy shmoli's daughter's Not sex <laughs> Yeah, because no, no one that I've said, if you, if you go ahead and interview 100 people that I've spoken to that have watched that debate, you say, give me the arguments that you've, you remember. Say, I maybe one remember one argument here, one argument there, but I just remember this guy's daughter has a sex shop. That's what I remember. <laughs> <laughs> no one's going to forget that. No, that's, it's, 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 it's imprinted in the minds of the people. Also, I think, I think the idea was to show him as a grifter, right? The idea was that this guy is, is, hmm. is a business-minded person. He's a grifter. He's not directly involved in the conflict. Sure. He's an armchair critic. And we have actual brothers and sisters dying on ground over there. Exactly, yeah. And it's, right, I, I, get, I, I genuinely got the sex shop yeah. anger. No, no, but I totally understand if someone says, I don't like your tactics. These tactics are problematic. I would have used another tactic. And that's fine. These are all, I would call it, personal choices. Everyone's going to have different styles and different tactics. It's like me watching a boxing match and say, well, you shouldn't have thrown that left hook. Mm. What you should have done is you should have pushed him away and you should have just done a right hook and a left hook. Anything could be said. But what I'm saying is, generally speaking, going into these, there are three things that... Because I, I train people for this. Like, uh, behind the scenes, people don't know this, but... Many people that have gone to Piers Morgan and, you know, many people that have been to different uh, interviews, we have training sessions with them. Mm. And this is the first thing I do when I train them. I say there are three things. There are arguments, there are strategies, and there are tactics. So they may say, okay, this is what I want to do in such and such interview. It might not just be with Piers Morgan. I give this, uh, you know, this part of Sapiens, what Sapiens does, in fact, right. for some people who engage with the media, we give them this kind of training, right? Especially if, if, if it's high profile, if it's to do with certain things. And so these are the things you're going to do. And you're always going to risk something. For example, you got to ask yourself, what are you comfortable being labeled as? Right. And what are you really comfortable not being labeled as? Mm -hmm. So these are all things, personal choices and whatever. But at the end of it, if someone comes at the end of it and says, this person dominated the other person, that's the most important thing, that you win. The general impression should be that the, that, that the interviewer was dominated by hijab. This, it's a fair, it's a fair. No, I mean, some people have completely different strategies. They don't right. want to be, they don't want to be abrasive at all. They don't want to do any ad hominems. So we, we tailor to that. I, what I'm saying is, so long as you have a clear strategy. Like with the, the doctor from the Hisp, what's his name? Again, I'm completely Abdul Wahid. Abdul Wahid Sahib. He, he had a completely sort of, uh, very like a uh, non-abrasive, very, you know. Yeah, well, I didn't actually do any training with him at all. So, uh. I, there, you know, there are things that, you know, I would have done differently. I'm sure he's watching my things and saying the same thing. But, I mean, with that particular interview, Piers Morgan scored the most incredible on goal. Because that's a different strategy that he's employed. Yeah, I don't know what happened, but Piers Morgan decided to just grab the ball turn around and shoot it into his own net by talking about Muslim women and, and these things. Yeah, it was, very, it was very weird. And in many ways, that was a turning point because after that, Piers Morgan was seen as, in a different way as a malicious character mm. by the Muslim community. So it depends on the sort of strategies that are being employed. And, yeah, you've got to think about outcomes. what you're trying to achieve. Everything is to do with objectives. And it's, it's an opportunity cost analysis that you do. This exactly. is what I'm willing to lose. This is what I'm willing to You're gain. always going to lose something. Okay. The conversation around uh, Gaza, uh, unfortunately, we've all been limited to debates and interviews and, you know, uh, social media activism. Tangibly, we found that the Muslim world and its leadership has not been in, has not been committed to its role, neither in the OIC, nor in the UN, nor in the ICJ. Yani the, uh, the approach to the ICJ that South Africa has taken it was the job of a Pakistan or a Turkey or an Iran or, you know, like, a, or a Saudi or a UAE. Uh, unfortunately, across the Muslim world, we see that there is, there is, there is a dichotomy of the, the regimes that manage those countries and then the actual populace whose sentiments lie otherwise. 
do you in the west feel a privilege and a responsibility as muslims who live in perhaps more open societies or more developed societies or societies with more access to power do you feel that the diaspora i mean we, it's clear that the that the muslim states have failed to do their job with regards to palestine do you feel a sense of responsibility that that maybe the levers of power and politics in the uk you know like we've always thrown our weight behind the labor party for example do you think that there was another way around this and do you think that muslims in the west have perhaps not been able to um influence the sphere of politics within the uk or the west in general to maybe make more uh, palestine friendly or muslim friendly policies from their uh, from the representatives have you guys ever thought about this in this angle of the uh, um i don't look i mean the thing is the muslim communities in europe um are not strong enough to be able to do something like that um uh, because their numbers don't, don't justify um that kind of influence on on foreign policy mm. you know i mean i don't think um that they could have what would be the equivalent of the zionist or israel lobby in america but that doesn't do that doesn't have to do with numbers though right the zionist lobby is it's 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 mostly a financial sphere of influence yeah sure so that the, the strength of the muslim community is in the numbers though it's not in the the finance effectively it's it's in the numbers like when it came to protesting right. you had 1 million people coming out protesting in london you couldn't get even 10% of that to vote, to protest for israel in london no so what i'm saying is that the strategy going back to the point with the muslim community in in europe has to be different to the zionist strategy because the zionist strategy they work on uh, lobbying and media and owning big businesses and these kind of things and influencing things through that we don't have the time to do all of that stuff right now and for us the path way to success and influence the the path of least resistance lies in using our numbers but the, using our numbers to the best of our ability we couldn't necessarily and effectively change policies to such a point where we would have if you like palestine friendly policies that would be equivalent to the israeli lobby i don't think that's a possibility no, my 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 contention is not this that in mm. in the here and now absolutely the muslim community has responded very well mm. i think that the younger generation you know especially the below 40 mm. uh generation of 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 diaspora muslims in the west uh, are very um- ummat minded and you know they 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 their their central focus is on an on an international ummatic level but uh, don't you think that historically because we've been there for 60 70 odd years Uh, historically we haven't grounded ourselves in a way that maybe the jewish zionist community has where we haven't pooled our resources uh, to form lobby groups yeah, I to think form think tanks it's possible i think there's more to be done the thing is you got to look at the demographics of each country hmm. so as you for uh, well no you know for example <laughs> <laughs> the muslim community in britain is of the working like the majority of them is working class primarily from pakistan and india and bangladesh so the demographics is number one, pakistan a muslim community number one pakistan number two is bangladesh and somalia is actually drawing as a number two spot now as well but number three is somalia mm-hmm. and then after that you've got like uh, other african countries and arab countries and stuff like that would be taking the fourth and fifth places um that's effectively what the muslim community looks like and of course there's other you know muslims from europe and bosnia and kosovo and albania and these kind of things they're they're you know a significant population if you like as well uh an important population but this is what the muslim community looks like now if you look at the socioeconomic grouping of the united kingdom muslims for example you'll find a lot of them in working class and then the lower end of the spectrum yeah and so it's not like we can't, we can't compete with mm. if you're trying to talk about money and pooling money and stuff we do very well when it comes to donating and you know for charity and stuff in fact david cameron himself said that the muslim community are the most generous community uh, in terms of in terms of charity but if you want to compete pound for pound with the israel lobby in america uh it's once again i don't think it's the right strategy no but the core of the problem is that uh, the pooling of the resources and and zia bhai can uh, you know testify to this fact it's always been geared towards historically you know 
uh, more material causes like hospital beds and 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 you know f- soup kitchens mm. and, and how like, how would you propose that like for example let's say we pull the money together what, I, I, what, what I, I, are we doing it for? This, this is what I think for example yeah. I'll give you the example of Pakistan and sure. the problem we have the same problem in Pakistan because mm. again I mean um, as the sixth province of Pakistan uh, <laughs> you know the UK has the same you know mm. problems as Pakistan um, the idea of sadaqat of zakat mm. the idea of giving charitable giving sure it's not it doesn't it doesn't have that modern training in that case we don't have a respect for the liberal arts for philosophy sure. for the humanities okay. culturally yeah. especially in the subcontinent mm. uh, the idea is that maybe we have to sponsor engineering seats for students yeah. medical oh, seats okay. for students okay Uh, clean water wells. Okay, Again, yeah. So I think these we're, are, we're these are talking real... about cross purposes because in my mind right. you were talking about like lobbying. I guess not. Uh, so mm. the idea of lobbying is completely alien to Pakistanis. It's starting to come up now, mm. uh, especially. Well, is that what you're advocating? Do you think we should start lobbying? We should start lobbying. We should, in essence, we need to develop think tanks that that help us make policy positions that are informed from an Islamic uh, paradigm. Because initially, you see, the problem is. that we're not we don't not living in ideal conditions even in the muslim world in we're, we're in the trappings of some level of a neoliberal democratic system or even worse mm-hmm. yani yeah, some monarchy like in in the gulf or somewhere in the countries that we have some level of freedom in terms of the way we operate we need to influence the policy making on a local level because it's surprising how easy it is to access power corridors from the outside it seems like it's impossible but when you start to interact with the uh, with the public with uh, with a certain segment so of society so practically how would that work? how would that look like in pakistan i think practically it would work in the way that you would have to develop think tanks because the cream or the best of the best in the liberal arts world mm. uh, we lose to the sort of the the, the liberal world order those mm. kids would be employed by ngos and think tanks that are western in pakistan or abroad so we would lose the best of them so we need to pool our resources in order to offer them uh, the material conditions where they can sit down and do research on and, and make policy positions and policy papers that mm. can be submitted to what about in the uk or in a western country in the uk and the western countries i think the problem is that a, a the problem of the the working communities b that they live mostly in sorry to say ghettoized conditions where they are in sort of uh close knit uh, urban or peri urban or suburban populations um i think the best way for would be something like uh, mohammed jalal right the thinking muslim guy something like a sapiens institute because we need to start oh, doing so you doing our advertisement for us yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. no no we're gonna, <laughs> we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna i'm gonna talk about all something these like youth club Some like youth club like youth club for example i'm sure they've had a nightmare of a time because i think you guys have been in in like 15 years you guys have been added if not more because the first time i heard about you i was a teenager okay so that's like a long time ago so uh, re- funding resources and even the human material resources so the quality the best quality of the students who are going into the sciences the political science the philosophy the economics they're not going to be religiously inclined or inclined towards working for religious organizations sure. that's going to be the, it's a problem from the get go that we're dealing with very poor quality human material <laughs> it's the human risk the quality of the human like the like i don't want to name people like in the uk i see them on 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 social media the brothers and sisters akhi you're a waste man you're this man like i i, I see all the you know the meerpuris in the pakistani community and fine they're not for me maybe they're for some other audience but i think that the resources are too scattered they're not concentrated in in, in any sort of meaningful why did you way. why did you um pick out the meerpuris because a lot of them will be watching and say this this is the kind of racism we face in pakistan this is the problem i i know i think i think it's a good kind of racism i think i think certain classes do need to be oppressed to correct their ways i'm not a <laughs> no, no, i'm not no, a no, culture, you can't say that i'm not, <laughs> I'm not a cultural relativist to the point where i think that you know all cultures are equal i think i think no but let me okay i'm, if, I'm if, totally if, messing I'll with be, you but. oh sure sure i was going to say because for my interaction with the meerpuris in in uh, england they've actually done very very well for themselves i know, i don't doubt it i don't yeah, doubt in it in terms of business in terms of um institutions and stuff like that it's a lot of the messages that have been built have been built from amirpur and so i've uh, i've got a good impression of them no 
Oh, I mean, I've got a good impression of them. I I know some of them. Heck, I'm related related to some of them. Sure. But the idea is that I think that I think we're coming from a paradigm, a, especially in Pakistan, where we have to learn the white man science, and we have this sort of approach towards engineering and medicine and these material subjects, yeah. where we think that the the material improvement of, of of our community will result in somehow the 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 revival of some sort of Islamic civilization. It's not the Sahaba were not living in the ideal material conditions. I mean, again, I, I don't want to give the Sahaba example. I think that's an unfair example that people give about trying to compare apples and oranges when trying to compare the the, the revolution that the Sahaba had uh, created with the with the guidance of the Prophet. I think mm. we live in very different material conditions, and of course, material upliftment and improvement is important, which is why. If you see the new generation of of the Pakistani community, you people have people like Muhammad Jalal, right, the thinking Muslim guy. You have with Bengalis, you have uh, Dili Hussain, one of your uh, oh, good right. friends, yeah. right? Uh, from the Egyptian uh, diaspora, we have you, right? So clearly, material upliftment does help, mm-hmm. but it's not the end all, right? Which is why with Sapiens, what are you guys trying to do? Do you think that philosophy and the teaching of philosophy is important for the modern Muslim? What do you think? I think a youth club agrees with us as well. And I would want to hear from Raja uh, by as well as some of the, the things that, because I want to know more about what youth club is doing as well. But what, what Sapiens is doing effectively is it's taking all of, you know, the Shahada, the, the declaration of faith is two things. It's la ilaha illallah, right? So it is negation and then it's affirmation, mm. right? So we focus a lot on the first part of the Shahada if you want to put it in a crude or crass way. Because now the first part of the Shahada, which is the negation and the deconstruction, has become more important than ever. People have now the new idols, the golden calf of the generation has become feminism, liberalism, secularism, egoism, whatever it may be. And we aim to surgically deconstruct those ideas using modern philosophical methods using rational argumentation, using a synthetic or amalgamation approach uh, or an interdisciplinary approach to the matter. And we've got many products and services that we offer uh, free of charge to the public. You know, everything can be accessed absolutely free of charge. And we've got books and a learning platform with thousands of people in that they go in and get examined and stuff like that because it's effectively the antidote of what we're trying to achieve. And the idea is that these are training programs for specific interdisciplinary, pro- you know, aspects of of, of the new the, the the new sort of. Um, is it just new atheism, or is it the no, new no, sort of? It's it's modern trends. It's mm. to do with the ideologies of the West, but generally the ideologies of the world. So we have some stuff also in Hinduism. We have stuff on Sikhism. We have stuff on Shiism. We have anything which goes against we would conceive the shahada, the the nafi and the ithbat, the negation and the affirmation. Of course, we then move on to the second part of the shahada, which is producing evidences for the veracity of Islam. Mm. And that includes arguments for God's existence, includes arguments for the prophethood of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu etc. And this is all in a rational framework. Would you say that that's how Youth Club is focused yeah, I on think, something similar? I think what we are doing is uh, similar but slightly different. So what we're doing is we're doing a combination of shubuhat and shahwat. Uh-huh. So what we're doing is we're saying, okay, so what are the diseases of the heart? Mm. And so when you look at the disease of the heart, that's where it all starts from. Because you see, we're working in a mostly majority Muslim population in the first place. So yes, we have the negation part here as well. So we deal with subjects like liberalism and feminism and LGBTQ and all of that. But it's primarily it's shubhat and shawat. So we're dealing with the doubts about Islam that are being created, whether it's people uh, misinterpreting uh, ayat of the Quran or having problems with certain aspects of the deen, which is taking them away from being a practicing Muslim. And at the same time, then we have the shahwat. So we're also going to schools and colleges and universities and asking them, you know, we you need to give up that life of sin mm-hmm. and not be tempted by desires and things like that and how to practically deal with those situations. So our mechanism is pretty much on those lines. So where does Sapiens come in? Sapien comes in to deal with our Shubuhat aspect. So that's where we get some fuel from Sapiens. 
and then we have our local ulama mashayikh who deal with the shahwat aspect learning from them connecting tazkiya is a big part of it yeah you know so yeah no, no, so okay social organization community building you know helping young young men and women to 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 get in touch with the tradition helping refute the, the sort of the attacks that you get from uh western liberal society all of this has to do with the sort of this pop piety right this 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 you know lgbt stuff and feminism and 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 oh they 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 they're dying their hair pink now and they've stopped shaving their armpits and do you, do you guys feel that that you guys have reached the limit with regards to this this sort of this genre or this field of 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 islamic inquiry because there is a circular aspect to this i feel that on the state level on the policy making level those are the gears of power or levers of power which you need to be working towards because don't you feel like you're stuck in a rut with these sorts of things because there's always going to be a new ism or a new you know it's ai now the kids are in the video games they're inside the phone now you know there's always going to be a bigger problem to deal with do you feel like any sort of revolutionary uh, change in muslim society across the world where we you know take up the mantle of our uh, of our salaf and 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 in our ancestral or or, 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 or you know uh, inherited sort of the 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 the, the standard of the quran and then the sunna i don't think as a, as a, as a third party observer as a lay person i don't think it's possible through the route of pop piety and this is my number one complaint with the youth club and my number one complaint with as much as i've interacted with the sapiens is that what is the next step because we look to you guys uh for guidance for connection with the scholarship um for uh you know for for opinion making and there's a, there's a new idea these days a, a thought leader so considering that you would i mean i you know you guys are humble guys you wouldn't you know, cook call yourself thought leaders but this is the new age of you know discourse via social media what do you think the next step is uh how do you how do we graduate from pop piety and this sort of you know he said she said and and going around universities and what's the next stage how do we influence uh, the policies of education in countries like pakistan how do we influence uh, parliamentary policy you know from family law all the way up to you know economic plans because pakistan i'll give an example technically the sharia court of pakistan has given the command to the state by 2024 yeah that they have to remove all commercial interest all riba all usury from the pakistani economy when and how or because the sort of conventional madaris uh, religious parties factions you name them political or otherwise they have failed to deliver in the past 30 40 50 60 odd years and what happens is that they get ossified you guys are the the new faces the young faces um you have enough of your you know feet in both worlds in the western and the eastern let's put it like that where you can maybe move the ticket forward in a way which is new innovative and uh, will lead to more tangible results on on the level of policy and i know this is not the actual uh subject of your uh, of your main body of work both of you guys but isn't this the next step or am i totally you know speaking out of school am i totally incorrect on this okay um do you want me to start first and then sure okay so uh, i'll give my little bit of analysis and then inshallah hijab can take over so i think this question comes up as soon as you become religious uh you want to make a change so i'll give you an anecdotal journey of sorts to explain to you my thinking and then youth club and how and what we're trying to do so when i was coming towards the deen i'm coming from a very secular liberal background myself uh having studied mostly in the west and then coming to pakistan and then looking at the situation here so as you're looking at the situation on ground and you're looking at you know all these things all these vices being spread out and that you've been a part of them uh you 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 want to change things and the nature of youth is that you want change asap you want to change now so believe me when i say this that when i came into the deen i thought perhaps uh, a more radical approach is required <laughs> okay so maybe yeah. you need to become a vigilante mm. maybe some because you know you 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 see things and you see a yeah, man yeah something like that yeah <laughs> so uh, a mysterious dark person in the night you know so you're thinking about you know how can you affect change as quickly and as rapidly as possible and i, I sorry i, I, yeah. I just i want to clarify my position it's not about the speed 
My, I understand. I'm talking about the direction. I understand. So this is the, this, this is, is the story of evolution. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So that's what I thought initially that perhaps because this is my gut feeling that you know uh, things aren't happening fast enough, and so that led me to. Uh, sit with a lot of different scholars from different backgrounds and questioning them that what are we doing why are we doing that? and so a, a lot of the scholars calmed me down and said you know this is you know read the seed of the prophet you will find your answers there read this read that and so when you start understanding the deen in the beginning i'm i'm sure a lot of youngsters who are overzealous when they come into the deen uh, they are a bit hyper in the beginning stages meaning that it's a lot of refutation a lot of and they're, all, they're all on twitter <laughs> <laughs> there's a lot of rad of this person rad of that person because yeah. you start looking at each other as lot you know PD- us lot, and lot, the others a lot of pdfs yeah so <laughs> <laughs> so so going through that phase you know and uh, talking to different scholars about what can we do now how can we effect change uh, one thing that i realized and this is my own opinion my own analysis and i'm talking with various scholars is that you know at the baseline of it change is in the hands of allah the results are in the hands of allah your job is to do the work now what is the work i will inshallah define that so first of all we know that you have to do whatever is in your capacity fattaqullaha mastatatum however much is your capacity you do that whatever is in your so because allah will hold you personally like me and you and everybody accountable for whatever we could have done in that state so what do i do so i can strategize i can think about solutions and you very rightly mentioned that you know coming up with think tanks and lobbying and this sort of thing and the fact that in the muslim world we give a lot of sadaqat and zakat and things like that to for example you know an orphanage or for example to the masjid or to and all of these are great but then there is a bigger elephant in the room and which is we are still subservient to a lot of our uh, past colonial masters and we're all in that big bubble and this is a major problem for the whole muslim ummah not just for pakistan but for pretty much everybody so how do we overcome this so in that when you start to uh, learn and understand one thing that i got from a lot of uh, scholars we met was that you know try to create people try to create people who are upon the way of the companions and the prophets try to create those people and let them be people who can be part of the bureaucracy let them be people who can be part of the politics let them be people who can be part of the military now, now, be- now you sound like now you sound like jamaat at tabligh okay so <laughs> so basically it's not it's not identical to that I, i think i think what the youth club is doing is is building a community yeah of people who eventually you you the, the idea is that you attract young people who then push the ticket with what can be done and 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 you know further these kinds of policies so um, yeah so i would say just a little bit that what we're trying to do is uh, target i mean our our dawa our message goes to everyone but in particular what we're doing is we're trying to uh, tap into the movers and shakers of society tap into these people and try to get them to at least if not become like let's say you know oliya wala spantal at least have an appreciation for islam have have a love for islam at least not be agents of opposition in our path at least facilitate that islam is spread at least for, for, for example if you have um islamic minded people in the judiciary for example if you have islamic minded people in the military if you have people like that in the politics if you have people like that in various spheres of life and if they are the people who are predominantly uh, the ruling class for example then i don't think it's really far fetched to see that uh, a state is established which is uh, alhamdulillah upholding uh, islamic values and eventually everything becomes inshallah better you know hey, brother hijab uh, like with what the youth club is doing it's very similar but dissimilar in the sense it's very modern it's very it's very cutting edge um we've seen this a lot with the ikhwan with jamaat islami with the tablighi jamaat with hisb at tahrir um uh the, the the ones who shall not be named hizb ut tahrir uh banned from most of the <laughs> most of the public sphere um a lot of the jamaats a lot of the ulama a lot of the mashayikh a lot of the speakers a lot of the, the 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 thought leaders have this idea that we have to have an increasing sphere of influence within the muslim world and then people at the right levels of power at the right time will slowly start to turn the wheel some are more aggressive than others maybe tablighi jamaat is the more sort of docile you know we need to achieve a mass quorum of an audience and then this will happen and mm-hmm. then hisbat tahrir oh, what's the alternative to that the alternative is revolution right with, the alternative would be a violent revolution yeah. which is what something hisbat uh, jamaat like hisbat tahrir would recommend yeah. that we can you know cool and and what do you think the end game for that would be 
is something similar to the arab spring a very yeah, uh, horrible so, outcome to a very so it was is that desirable or? not at all no my question is not uh, again i know you you tend to go into debate more trying to put me on the back foot mike <laughs> no 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 I'm, <laughs> my line of question i'm is, just trying to get because what he described what um roger just described i think is a fair is the ideal way condition. it's not ideal but i think it's the only thing you can do because if if you if you're look there's a multi-pronged approach you could say grassroots you could say speak to people you could say spiritual you could say intellectual you could say political influence you could say charity you could say all these things which are working within the system the only other alternative to that is working outside of the system which is which a is problem. yeah which which is revolution now the thing is i would never would i would never uh, advocate a revolution in a country where the military is as strong as the Pakistani military or the Egyptian military I mean. why because we we need those militaries to fulfill our objectives do you think that militias are going to take on the west no it's not going to be militias it's going to be the military so you cannot do this fight without those militaries you cannot do anything without this so libya being the worst example to show uh, libya is a know. small country compared to pakistan no, but the, the very tragic sort of you know yeah yeah sure i mean so what i mean is, is uh, what would happen is if if this revolutionary kind of uh, environment was created the most likely outcome would be that it would be crushed immediately you'd have people that would be killed and end up in jail and jailed or worse. and that's it and so uh, this approach that he just described is much more superior in my these opinion these are the these are the broad strokes of what we all agree on that we need to have a sort of peaceful resolution within the given systems of let's say pakistan has a sort of a hybridized broken sort of democracy mm. and we push the ticket forward uh, uh, and pakistan has things which many other muslim countries don't which for example I was speaking to one of the legal experts today uh, if you look at the constitution of Pal- uh, pakistan yes. it says that all laws have to be subservient to islamic law no example. law shall be passed repugnant to the quran, quran and, and the sunnah, sunnah. Yeah. Actually, and sovereignty yeah. belongs to allah so we have technically our constitution has said the shahada yeah perhaps so you can work with this kind it's of it's not thing. a revolutionary demand perhaps it's a more revivalist demand where right, we so where's the, 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 no but, <laughs> no, but his, his, <laughs> but because, no all i'm saying is at what point does it become uh revolutionary and stop being revivalist is at the point where you start working outside of the system and what he's describing is all the things that you can do within the system what you said before about the think tanks is another thing you can do within, within the system yeah within now if you if you come out of that look, let's let's be frank about this if we want to be as frank as possible look look at ISIS al-qaeda okay. and ISIS yeah yeah okay so put aside their un-islamic behavior because that's something let's just look at them politically as a political entity right um how what was their lifespan their lifespan was what well, i don't know how long they were not even a decade yeah it was nothing it was a complete nothing yeah, yeah because <laughs> because th- they were in a rush to be in power but be, but absolutely they had no but pragmatic abs, abs, prowess absolute, at all absolutely but bad. they represented the extreme of the revolutionary spirit but absolutely in, in many ways without sounding too uh yeah. you know controversial they represented much of what hizb tahrir was saying in yeah, on yeah, paper absolutely. they did in practice in practical yeah so with, know, with banger machines yeah, yeah. Not, not of course <laughs> we're not talking about not talking about the the, the atrocities and the crimes because no, no, no. yeah but they represent and look look where they are so what i mean is we look, we do have to look at our past 100 years without khilafa and we have to look at the successes and we have to look at the failures the groups that you've mentioned okay although they might not have done what you know what you want them to do right they ha- they actually constitute the most successful groups yes. materially that the muslim um actually like we were having a conversation before the podcast the jamaat at tablighi is one of the most successful jamaats yeah. in in, in so, from uh, south asia so in many ways i i don't think um there's much more that can be done except that if we do this in a multi-pronged way in a more disciplined and organized way uh then it would be successful just like muhammad jinnah said you know he said the iman he said at tanzim Ittihad. Ittihad and Tanzim, which is like a, a discipline. But Tanzim means organization in Arabic. Yeah. But nevertheless, all these three things, if we do those three things that Muhammad Jinnah said in Pakistan, in Egypt, in Turkey, in, in Iran, that is the way forward. You heard it, you heard it here first, guys. Uh, Muhammad Jinnah will sacrifice his life for Pakistan. <laughs> and he will uh, move to Pakistan and settle in uh, um, yeah, Sihala. Yeah. 
<laughs> <laughs> uh, no, but so okay. These are the broad strokes of what this the way forward is. I can really agree with you that going out again. It's a very good analysis that Raja. What, what would you do this? Anything more? Because I, I'm I'm interested. You're a very intelligent man. I'm interested in your mm. contribution. Uh, so I think uh, it's it's a classical it's a classical wrestling move that you've done. You've used my own weight against me. Uh, no, no, it's, uh, <laughs> I've just I've just turned you uh, taken you off the playing field and into the pitch. Mm. Because I, now I, I, you I, have I, to listen, struggle with what they've almost been struggling with. I'm somebody, years. I'm, no, I would say, why are you stuttering? Um, I'm um, critic <laughs> has now become. <laughs> <laughs> why are you stuttering? Uh, tell me uh, now. Tell that's me. My, I mean, I think that's my job up till now is to be an armchair critic. But let me, tell me, let, tell me, me. let me give you a step by step analysis sure. of what I've understood from what you guys have uh, no. provided. I think Zia Bhai gave a very beautiful analysis of uh, the younger minded Muslim. Yeah. Uh, the younger Muslim is more aggressively minded and they want tangible results immediately. And I think we've all experienced this. I don't know what it was like for you in the West, um, growing up, especially in our mid to late teens, yeah. you have your rebellious phase, you have your existential crisis, you some, Alhamdulillah, I discovered Islam, other kids, maybe not, right? They ended up with some other ism or some other, you know, uh, nightmare scenario, mm. uh, some sort of gender and sex rediscovery or something, you know. Mm. Uh, we ended up with Islam, maybe it was our upbringing, mm. you know, the karam of Allah, whatever. Um, you start to get, uh, you know, there's a very big appeal. It also depends on your personality type. It's a very big appeal to the more militant factions. Uh, growing up in a post 9-11 sort of scenario, I think uh, Afghanistan was something we used to look towards with a lot of, um, a lot of, a lot of pride and a lot of uh, hope and a lot of, um, a lot of our religious sentiments were tied up with the Taliban at that time. Of course. It's a very common phenomenon in uh, Pakistan at the mm. time. Mm -hmm. uh, and then Pakistani state policy did a 180. And the Pakistani state decided that maybe the Afghan Mujahideen and the, the anti-Soviet effort, when geared towards the Americans, is now they're the Khawarij, <laughs> it's haram, this, that, and the other. And, you know, uh, and this is a problem now. And that led to uh, a very, a very, uh, uh, a very sizable civil war that happened in Pakistan. It's a very silent civil war, I think. A lot of people don't talk about it as a civil war, but I think it was a civil war, essentially, in the north of Pakistan, in the Khyber Pakhtunkhwa province. That also had a big influence on anyone growing up at that time, especially if they were religiously inclined. Um, a famous example would be that the Jamaat Islami, which is a lot of what religious people would support. I, for example, coming from a fairly conservative background, my grandfather used to say that I have to answer for my vote. So I only vote for the Jamaat Islami. And on the day of Qiyamah, I have to answer for who I voted for. So I only vote for Jamaat Islami. The leader, the Amir of Jamaat Islami, at that time gave a very controversial statement about the civil war. And then he was subsequently, well, you know, uh, completely uh, banned from public media. And, you know, the Jamaat was pressurized and eventually had to uh, resign from his position. Munawar Hassan Sahib Jithe. That had a profound influence on my thinking and the way I viewed the world. Again, uh, we go on with our daily lives and, and on our localized levels in the drawing rooms. In what sense? In in what sense? The political or democratic out the sort of the the outlets that existed. Pakistan has a good enough system where there are outlets for steam to be let let out from society through the electoral process and the voting process. Immediately there was a there was a culture of oh Jamaat Islami Urdu mein, in our Urdu language. Jamaat Islami with a cross. There's a big X mark on Jamaat Islami from the local and international establishment. This was an accepted idea in, in the religious classes. That led to a sentiment which I think has been pervasive. The, the steam that was lost to pan-Islamism. You had a lot of people from here go into ISIS. Uh, a lot of families moved to Syria and Iraq. This is fairly well documented and well known because of that, you know, the steam was still going from the pan-Islamism uh, ideal. I think that in order for us to actually influence the levers of power, we need to even work with the secular parties in Pakistan. There, there are no real secular parties in Pakistan, but the more center-left leaning in economics, by the way, in Pakistan, all parties are center-left. Uh, they have a Keynesian sort of idea about how the state has to develop infrastructure and provide XYZ number of basic uh, amenities and facilities. In terms of their social organization, they can go from the more conservative Jamaat Islami, TLP, um, uh, what would be another conservative, JUIF, the Jamiat Ulama Islam, uh, Fazl Rahman Party, all the way to the most extreme, I would say, the People's Party is the most socially liberal party. 
I think the way to to work towards this is that if people like the youth club, like the Sapiens Institute, would help the Pakistani community develop a public narrative and have think tanks to translate that public narrative into tangible policies and then because we do have some semblance of electoral democracy so the the politicians are somewhat answerable to the electorate i think that if it's a pakistan specific issue then there has to be someone very well versed with what's going on in pakistan so that's more maybe a job for youth club than it yeah. is for say i think it's more of a job for eon podcast to actually take over <laughs> why put everything on youth club yeah <laughs> <laughs> because the one thing that i mean we have a very specific strategic you know goal at yeah. sapiens institute and that is the intellectual revival of islam and these things it requires deep knowledge of the no, Urdu language yeah, no, 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 the culture of the country i think i think the english allows you a lot of access to mm. the pakistani society because and also what is it the business of uh, if one wants to play devil's advocate what is it the business of people who don't live in a country to make policy decisions I think uh, in many ways that could be the same colonial thing that no, 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 we're accusing. So, so no, no, no. Yeah. I, I we're not asking you to make policy positions for us, not at all. Yeah. We're asking you to, to participate in this, uh, this. This this is all for public consumption. Sure, yes, sure. to participate in the sort of Islamic revival and connection of Pakistan with the rest of the Ummah, which allows for there to exist public sentiment and pressure on the politicians. It's true, but it and then it's the job of the local bodies and organizations like the youth club yeah. to help develop think tanks yeah. that work towards policy. So I'll give you a tangible example. Sure. Uh, these guys led the charge. So we had uh, we had an imported bill that came from the Human Rights Watch, Watch South Asia, which is uh, basically a colonial, uh, like an IMF or like a World Bank. It's a policy making thing. It's not for economics. It basically pressurizes us on soft issues like gender and and and, and sex and social organization, and they pressurize us to have policies that are more that are more conducive to Western liberal democracy. They gave us a bill and it was passed unanimously in the National Assembly because our politicians simply are not concerned with what the public sentiment is. They have no idea what the, even the policy is. It comes in a closed packet. They're like, sure, we'll pass it. It was presented as an intersex bill. The, the idea, because we have a segment of uh, of an intersex community, the Khunsa uh, Mushkil, like you call it in Arabic, uh, but it was actually an LGBT bill. It was disguised as an intersex bill to provide securities and freedoms for intersex individuals and civil liberties for them. It became a big nightmare. I think something like forty thousand men applied for the female police department. It was like university hostels, and so the youth club, the Jamaat Islami, other groups fought with civil society, uh, lobbied, provided law, provided lawyers, pressurized the politicians, and they got the bill overturned. Mm. So there is a tangible translation to so that was a defensive maneuver, right? Mm. I'm talking about the offensive stuff. Number one, there is a there is a complete dearth and a lack of body of a body of work on Islamic economics. In economics. fact, economics. Economics. Mm. In fact, Islamic. While saying the, the word Islamic economics, it is it's almost an oxymoron at this point because Islamic banking is a completely made made up framework and, and so on. So I don't want to get into the, the roots and, and weeds of uh, the problem of uh, finance and the relationship that Islam has with modern Islam has with it. We need to figure this stuff out and we have the material resources, human resources, but they're being spent on Western NGOs and Western think tanks and Western lobby groups. So the best of your economics graduates from Pakistan and abroad, Pakistanis who go abroad, they're going to go work for think tanks in the West or here that are Western backed, they're going to work for consultancy firms like Accenture or, and, and PNG and, and whoever. And they're going to work for uh, l- lobbying and policy uh, uh, think tanks that are in the West. Uh, they're not going to work in Pakistan. Mm-hmm. It is the responsibility of the religious community to organize. And I, and I genuinely don't believe it's the job of any one group. I genuinely don't believe it's the job of any one group. The, the place where Sapien comes in is that Pakistan does not have a very rich tradition in the English language, at least I can't speak to Urdu, of, 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 of philosophy in the lens of Islam in the universities and in the schools. Sapiens has done the groundwork, the, has done the legwork. We can stand on the shoulders of literal giants, by the way. Uh, so uh, that's what I think that this, this cultural crossplay and that this idea of, of, of colonialism, it's not a reverse colonialism because we willingly accept Muslim influence in Pakistan. Pakistani foreign policy is practically dictated by Saudi Arabia and the UAE, uh, historically speaking. Now maybe the situation might change, uh, inshallah. And that too due to public pressure. 
so recently the interim prime minister uh, gave a statement where he contradicted pakistan's historical position on the 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 two state solution pakistan does not agree with the two state solution in palestine right and it was public pressure from groups like the youth club that forced him to take back his statement right so i think that the interplay between the religious and the political now that veil needs to be dropped and i think that uh, this the more liberal leaning parties like the pti and the and the people's party the pmln also need to be influenced to make because we're not concerned with who wins yeah agreed, right agreed. we're concerned with the policy ends that we get so and so domestic policy again more or less it's the same the 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 the, the buffet options are very limited in pakistan it's the more the foreign policy and the national scale policy agendas that that we need to start to influence the reason why i say think tanks and lobby groups uh have to have cultural you know interplay with with the diaspora is because you have the best material conditions you have the best human material resources as well the best of the best in academics in the muslim world it's a higher statistical chance that they're going to be in europe in america and in canada and you guys can help set up this sort of um international nexus so the jamaat islami has a very good relationship with ikhwan for example which allows them to do a lot of their charity work in turkey in syria in lebanon in and in gaza through their sister organizations in turkey and in egypt right similarly i think on the on the influencer sphere or the vlogger sphere whatever this is um we all need to connect because also it would really piss off liberals absolutely yeah absolutely. really <laughs> really make them mad look i mean absolutely i think we both agree that that's that's what this is all about um we try and offer as much of our services as possible and and youth club are doing a great job in translating a lot of what we're saying uh, in the west into the urdu language and into the cultural context of the pakistani community but i've also realized i mean and this is something i do want to kind of repeat that and it's mentioned usul fiqh as well as one of the if you like the qawaid al hukm ala shay far'un an tasawwurihi that ruling on something is um contingent on knowing what that thing is in the first place uh, and so pakistan in society in order to be really treated with respect it has to be treated with someone people need to be with from within the community they know the cultural sensitivities of the tribes they know the languages of the tribes they know the people they know what they would respond to positively they know what would respond to negatively they use their language you know uh, as allah says in the quran we have not sent a people except bilisani qaumihi liyubayyin lahum except with his language so that's the kind of thing where youth club i've seen have been using a combination of english and urdu and this is the kind of synthetic approach that is required and of course we can help in as much as things can be generalized like the the frameworks that we're using but then it would be the work of people like youth club and no, others no 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 i I, I'm so, i think you still you still you still so soft on the issue sure. the liberal community in pakistan mm. they have a huge pool of human and material resources coming from the west sure yeah. journalists intellectuals they're coming on lecture tours they're doing the book tours they're, really? they're, yes like who from, from the 2000s from the 2000s um I can't any, give any you notable names. Not the, not the notable ones. We get oh, okay. we get the B C T D team, right? We get oh, the low tier okay. ones because Pakistan is is easy fish, right? It's an easy game. Uh but they have a vast corpus of literature, media and they, they don't have to even do their job. Their job sure. is being done by the So how can the safe industry help? Like let's put this in. Yeah. Tangibly, I think if you have teacher training programs, I sure. think if you have uh, it's the first batch that matters, I think. Mm. That first batch of so we have English medium high schools. Mm. all over pakistan they have religiously inclined students with religiously inclined parents but they don't have the material conditions to impart to them any sort of philosophical lessons in the paradigm of islam sure so the teacher training programs mm. the 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 student groups and organization they've done the groundwork right you just inject that sort of uh, so i think intellectual dimension into it sapiens has done that i think it came like four times yeah So this is the fifth time I think. Right. Yeah, are you are you guys organizing seminars and and yes, and, yeah. and the reason why I think you shouldn't be so soft on this I know you're being yeah. very culturally sensitive and it's very respectful towards the Pakistani people and we we love you for that but you're dealing with hmm. billions of dollars we're competing against the actual NGO industry of Pakistan sure is a, a multi million dollar industry the kind of salaries these people are drawing so they're being paid a lot mm. they're being given scholarships to top universities in the west they're being trained in 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 you know 
uh, in the best institutions for the liberal arts for the human sciences mm -hmm. so it's going to be a big big challenge to deal with them on an intellectual level i'm talking on the street level they're not a problem alhamdulillah mm -hmm. pakistan is a rural agrarian economy mm -hmm. we know how to deal with them it's on the intellectual sphere with uh, it's not that we're lacking it's just that the material resources and the human resources perhaps cannot yeah. necessarily that's, that's, you've, you've hit the nail on the head there I think that's where we can help and where inshallah inshallah we are, we're trying to help already so we've come four times in the last know, couple not of years not just the sapiens yeah. everyone yeah, yeah. I, I genuinely even Hizmat Tahrir for example I, I, I get it they're like a no-go zone but I think the nucleus of Islam has like layers around it I even see the Jamaat Tabligh as the outermost layer sort of you know access point it's 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 well enough that it does its job you know it's somewhere in the most remote part of pakistan people who don't even know how to pray they mm -hmm. go and teach them how to pray they go and teach them how to be good muslims sure. how to fast so i think an ecosystem needs to be created mm. pakistan has 250 million people and their resources to leverage we have a huge western diaspora community across the muslim world in pockets in different countries like in egypt there are places that are safe safer sort of spaces where we can organize these sorts of uh, uh, cooperative events. But I think that, I think, so I'll give you an example. I think that on 7th October, Hamas, they didn't attack Israel. They finished the UN-based liberal rules order. It's done. I think they destroyed it. I think they killed, what was his name? Archduke Franz Ferdinand. <laughs> <laughs> I think they shot him. And what is that has done is that it has allowed <laughs> The Western powers receding from the Middle East and from South Asia and Central Asia has allowed a space to allow us vacuum to occupy. And the speed with which we move is, is of paramount importance. And I think I think Allah has put the, the, the diaspora community in the West in Western Europe and in America and in Canada for a reason. Less so in America and Canada, I think. I think Western Europe has uh, a higher testosterone Muslim population <laughs> compared to let's say America or Canada. Let's let me just put it like that. So I don't I don't think you should take it lightly. I don't think you should take your uh, relationship with Pakistan lightly. No. Uh, and I contrary. think I think you should consider uh, sacrificing your life. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no. Uh, speaking of this 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 whole situation, right? I'll give you an example, a tangible example. Your best friend Jordan Peterson. Children loved him here. Conservative people loved him here. You had young people uh, who were perhaps not being able to deal with all the isms. Yeah. I mean, youth club was doing its job, but again, uh, a variety is the spice of life, right? So people were turning, turning towards Jordan Peterson. I mean, they couldn't see the sort of writing on the wall that this guy was like some, you know, like a nutcase Christian Zionist type character. Uh, but there was some material where... Uh, the children were benefiting. The young people were benefiting. So if they can turn towards Jordan Peterson, I, I don't think they have a problem with working with a hijab or a, or a Muhammad Jalal or a, or a Dili Hussain or anybody. Uh, I don't think you should be shy about that. No, that, that part of it, I agree with. Certainly, <laughs> no problem at all. How did you find Jordan Peterson, by the way? You've met him twice now, yes? Once um, on the web and once physically. Yeah, I mean, it's kind of like what you see on the, what you see is what you get, to be honest with him. Did he cry? Oh, you saw the video. He did cry one time, at least. Um, they look. called me rabbi. <laughs> <laughs> and that's a big... Uh, why don't you get some guys around the UK to go around call him Malvi Saab? You know, maybe, maybe, that'll, maybe that'll make him cry for real. Um, what was your question, sorry? How did you find him? Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, the thing is with him is that, honestly, I don't think he is a Christian. You mentioned him as a Christian. I, I don't think he is. I think he's actually... Um, Irreligious. Um, 100%. Yeah, and without going into too much details of private conversations, but effectively when we had conversations about religion, his friend and his wife, is, they, they seem to be on different wavelengths in terms of religiosity. So his wife seems to be like a true Christian, if you like. Um, his friend was a, a true Christian, but I think both of them are trying to... And his daughter might be Muslim if, uh, Muslim. if Andrew Tate gets his way. <laughs> no, his daughter is a Christian now. She came out, I think, Mashallah. as a Christian. But he himself is not, I don't think he's religious like that. I, uh, this, 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 I oscillate between two things. I find him to be a bit of a grifter and, I, and, and maybe he's just a confused uh, dad who's, who's watching the collapse of Rome. It's, it's somewhere between that. Is, what, what is the actual case? Do you think he's just a confused man who hasn't figured out his religious identity or is, has, has problems reconciling he's, his beliefs with the West? 
I the, think he has been um he has been influenced by Nietzsche. He makes that open. Uh and Nietzsche, his position on Christianity is that he criticized the church but he praised Jesus. And I think effectively that's his position, bro. Like he mm. he criticizes Christianity, but I think the character of Jesus Christ he, he likes him. As for his political views, I think he'll go where the money takes him, as we saw. <laughs> Uh, uh, the Daily Wire is giving him a, you know, a substantial amount of money uh, to to live and work and operate, and of course and the propaganda is for on the behalf of the state of Israel. Yeah, but the thing is, he's never had these positions before. So no. if he really felt strongly about Israel, and and he also and he also has the public intellectual bug where there's no serious inquiry or academic work that he's doing now. Now he's just giving his opinions willy nilly on everything that's maybe not even his. Area yeah. of expertise. Do you also feel afraid of, of becoming a public intellectual? Is that a fear that you have? The thing is, uh, uh, hopefully, I will know my limitations. A man's got those limitations. So the difference there, hopefully, would be is that on an issue which I'm not, you know, schooled or taught or have enough information, I wouldn't speak about it. Um, that's where I think a lot of his mistakes as of late have been obviously he's now speaking about the Palestine Israel issue and getting involved in it and stuff mm. like that and I don't think he has enough information about that kind of issue to speak about it confidently so he knows that he's failed on that and the public has seen and he's lost a lot I mean because of it so Jordan Peterson I think um, unfortunately for him you know has become actually quite irrelevant compared to how he used to be a year ago it's actually quite shocking the decline uh, of Jordan Peterson based on one or two moves that he's made politically or otherwise. Because I think it's not just Muslims. I think even non-Muslims look at him and say he's lost his credibility because now he's got a master, effectively. That's how they see it. And his master is the Daily Wire. That's how people conceive of the situation. So um, they, they, don't, they don't take him as seriously as they used to because they, part of his selling point before was that this guy is... You know, going to speak the truth no matter what, and he's not got someone you know over him telling him what to do, and he doesn't fear the consequences. And he was, you know, speaking about freedom of speech and attacking the transgender movement and stuff like that. Now he's not doing any of that. Um, he's got his base. Uh, now he's in fact uh, being manipulated by the Daily Wire or Ben Shapiro or whoever it may be, and that's a very bad look for him. In fact, it's the worst possible look for someone with his. Branding, if you like, the, the intellectual stature that he developed as a as a yeah, I mean, it's, it's off brand. I mean, it's it, it's completely in in a way contrary to his brand. So I think his it was a really bad move, um, uh, brother Hijab. I mean, this is something that maybe you can speak more to. Uh, maybe Jab, I can also uh, comment. There is Jordan Peterson comes up in the increasing. He he, he doesn't exist in a vacuum. Right, you see, especially in America, you see a polarization where the the sort of quote unquote Anglo-Saxon or white or the ethnically white uh, Christian Christian inclined or right wing or conservative communities are starting to organize. They're starting to they developed like a they developed like a there's an ex, there's been an extreme polarization at both ends uh, on the left as the radical left and the, the LGBT and then you know fifth, sixth, whatever seventh generation of feminism or wave of feminism that's been going on. At the same time, you see the reaction on the conservative right in America, in Canada, in Europe, um, and that and that whole zeitgeist allows for Jordan Peterson to be you know in the mainstream. And perhaps now the ticket has been pushed farther towards the right within the average conversation in in the in the Western world. Do you think that the historical relationship that Muslims have had in these countries? With uh, the Democratic Party or the Labour Party or the more liberal factions who have been more accepting to immigration, to welfare, to the sorts of things that the luxuries that we've enjoyed in the Western world, public housing and the like, do you think that it's time or the time has come or we're too late to shift our allegiances to the more conservative um, uh, segments of Western society because? Clearly, on a lot of social issues, they they align with us. Yeah, or but on, is on there, the issues of Palestine, you saw what their stance is on that as well. So it's no, but in the far right, don't you think that there's an anti-Zionist sentiment as well? Like, where? Like, give me an so, example. For example, Keith Woods is a very popular uh, Irish uh, uh, public intellectual speaker. Who sure, is, but that's uh, Ireland, and this country of like I don't know five million people. Let's talk about the UK, for example, right? So who in the on the so right wing? Nick Griffin. Yeah, but he doesn't have a single seat in parliament. Right, Nick Griffin is not. So you think that 
But don't you think that there is in a segment of the right that is astroturfed to maintain the actual... Uh, do you think that... So, let's say there is a barrier. Mm-hmm. And that barrier is the Israel barrier, let's say. Mm-hmm. For for the right wing to cross that barrier, don't you think it would be easier for them to, if the, the Muslim community aligned with them and helped them cross that sort of hurdle, overcome that hurdle? Because it's clearly a big burden on Western foreign policy, Israel is. I think this is, uh, I w- look, I think the left wing want the Muslim soul and the right wing want their bodies. Um, and the Muslims need to start making their own parties and being independent and, you know, running as independents. I think... If there was one political direction, I would say it should be that one. I, I don't agree with either the left or the right or the mainstream parties. I think all of them, and the Muslims generally in the UK, are fully disillusioned with both the Labour Party and the Conservative Party on these issues, especially after the Palestine situation. No, Keir Starmer was a nightmare, right? Yeah, right. but so is his alternative, you know, Rishi Sunak. And <laughs> so all of them are nightmares. We don't need to give them our votes. So, me personally, I would I would completely abstain from giving all of any of all of these people my vote so do you think in america and canada it would be harder but do you think that so in canada for example same thing with america no but in canada and canada. in canada like for example the sikh diaspora they created a fairly decent power group with the national defense party with jagmeet singh you might have seen him very strong young man with the big turban mm-hmm. uh, they created a good power broker party which eventually the trudeau government had to form a, a, a coalition with obviously they were more on a liberal left leaning spectrum uh, and, that's and, and what is he doing for the Sikh community? I mean, what's he doing for that? The thing is, you know, you can argue Hamza Yusuf, you know, the guy that's in the first minister of Scotland. Right. What's he doing for us? Just because uh, he's S- got, Sadiq Khan, for example. Oh, these are coconuts. They're effectively coconuts. They're, they're brown on the outside and white on the inside. So people like that being in power serve no benefit to the Muslim community at all. So access does not equal power. Yeah, exactly. This, I so, think that this is... <clears throat> Where one of the criticisms I have of the Muslim Brotherhood, in fact, is that when you when you take this too far, this, this rule of pragmatism, when you take it too far, then the 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 ends the means end up being the ends, and then you forget what the end is in the first place. The same problem with the Jamaat Islami in Pakistan that they they've made a coalition with I think every single party in Pakistan and it's always failed. Well, I don't think they're that deep. I mean, you wouldn't find them making coalition or being endorsing. You know, Ikhwan Ikhwan did the border thing, mm. uh, which was absurd. The, the 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 and then and then in, in, I think it was Morocco or was it where they signed the treaty with Israel, the recognition treaty, while the Ikhwan government was there. Was yeah. that Algeria or Morocco? No, Morocco recently. Morocco, yeah. yeah. And it was in an Ikhwan government, right? No, no. I mean, they don't have an Ikhwan, but they've got a monarchy there. No, but that's some sort of coalition with the... Uh... They've got some of these in the, in the parliament, yeah, 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 but yeah. It's, they've, got, they've got a monarchy. They've got a monarchy, yeah. yes, that's true. Um, all right, so, so, so pragmatism has led Muslims down a path where... No, I, I, I believe in pragmatism, but I think if you take it too far... Too far, okay. And this extreme sort of pragmatism or opportunism... Uh, with the diaspora community has led them down the path of the labor of the labor party in the uk for example and now they have lgbt in schools and you know they're everyone is scared for their lives now they're coming after them uh, because the muslims maybe are the last sort of uh, holdout against the sex and gender reformation that's happening in the west and being exported to the east because uh, and his, 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 his group is standing alone <laughs> fighting them in pakistan are there any groups, just sorry to interject, yeah. but are there any other groups apart from Youth Club that are doing the work that Youth Club are doing on the kind of scale and level that Youth Club um, Well, there are small uh, attempts by different groups out there, but I don't think uh, the kind of uh, appeal that we've had with um, the educated class, for example, that's being replicated anywhere. And so what Aman Bhai was saying earlier on about you know how um, there's a lot of work that we can now do within the system in terms of creating think tanks and also, you know, by the usul uh, of Ta'awun al birri wa taqwa, we can, we can do a lot of work, which is not necessarily that it's only dawa, but it's also activism. And there's also kind of lobbying. On, the level, our, on the level of policy, inshallah. On, on the level of policy. And so one thing you mentioned very nicely was that, you know, there's a defensive strategy, sure. Uh, anything comes from there. So we're just, they're throwing the bouncers and we're just playing them. But now we need to be, on the offensive as well by getting people together. And then this brings in the whole issue of, you know, there's a lot of money coming into Pakistan. It's no secret coming from uh, the Gulf states. It's coming from other parts uh, of, you know, a lot of relief work, a lot of philanthropic work going on. I think 
um, we really need to kind of channel that and have people coming in and developing a solid system whereby it's not just DAO, but it's, it has to be multi-pronged. Mm -hmm. uh, you have to be effective in various areas because uh, we, need, we need people in policy, we need people in judiciary, we need people in uh, highest levels of bureaucracy. Because a lot of what has happened now, for example, in Pakistan is that um, a lot of the liberal class might be at the top levels. So the policies that are being made uh, behind closed doors, a lot of the NGO culture that's here, uh, a lot of the uh, direction is coming from the West. And for example, the media completely, completely covered by Western propaganda. And it's not even secret anymore because they even said, you know, we're now pumping in $200 million for the Pakistani media. We're now pumping in $500 million for the gender studies program in Pakistan. I mean, even they were criticized, uh, Western politicians in the US were criticized by opposing parties that we have people dying in Detroit and other it, parts of- It was during mm, COVID, by the way, yeah. that they gave us a $200 million relief bill for gender for gender studies gender programs. studies programs in Pakistan and the Americans were like what the hell? we're dying of this disease yeah. uh, and, and and we have so much extra cash to like give dude, away you know you know the Bab you know the Babylon Bee right yeah, uh, the, yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. It's, it's 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 a it's a it's a sort of satire newspaper they give like news headlines that are fake it was a hilarious news headline of a guy in like an ISIS style fighting uh, equipment with a clash and cough and he's pointing towards like an anime girl. And it says Pakistan was given $200 million to study gender. They figured it out. It was only two. <laughs> <laughs> so, so again, we know that these things are not actually meant to achieve the end results that they want to. They're meant to, uh, to make, keep people fat and happy in certain segments of Pakistani society, to maintain uh, Western hegemony in our intellectual spheres, in our universities and schools, in our media. Uh, it's meant to, it's meant to keep, to, you know, keep the government going, uh, in terms of, uh, these, so they call them soft issues that they can give to the West. And because most of these bills are in English, so they never really end up, uh, uh, in the hands of the, the common public. But I think that, uh, it's equally as big of a challenge that you guys are going to face in the West in terms of the third party candidates as we are going to face here lobbying different political parties to pass the bills and to do the kind of legislation that is uh, beneficial to the Muslim community at large. And the hardest is always going to be foreign policy, right? That's, mm. that's, the, that's the one that's the most uh, contentious. And we've all been trying for, uh, since, the, the, since the moment, I think the, the galvanizing effect that 7th October had, um, but I don't think any headway has been made any, uh, the day before uh, today. Uh, yesterday, we had uh, a Save Gaza campaign, which is a lobbying sort of group that they've developed uh, with the help of the youth club and other, other people, other like-minded individuals, where they are lobbying the government to have a public trial yeah. of the Israeli war crimes in the OIC, which is one of the big demands that they have. And the OIC has always been actively utilized and patronized by Pakistan. Mm -hmm. Pakistan has always been a big... Uh, any. Um, uh, uh, it's, it's it's always been big in OIC politics, right? Yes. But we've seen that since the Gulf states have sort of repealed their status and attitude towards the OIC and have uh, have pursued a more Israel-centric policy, especially the Saudi Arabia and the UAE. I've heard, I hope you all have made Hajj, by the way. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I have, so... Um, second Hajj is over, I guess. Yeah, there's, there's, there's no chance there's for second Hajj party. Uh, Not after this podcast. Not after, not after this podcast. <laughs> uh, the Pakistani government tends to, sh because a lot of our nuclear assets were developed by Saudi Arabia and the UAE, the financing was provided by from the Gulf. Uh, they have a share in our, uh, this is hush hush, this is not, this is like real politic type stuff. This is not supposed to be mainline uh, conversation. But because of that, they've always had a, there's always had a significant influence uh, over us. And we've even helped and participated in the war against Yemen, for example, in terms of planning and organizing the Saudi army, which is... Yeah, I was quite surprised in Karachi when I was yeah. driving around. I saw pictures of uh, Malik Faisal, in fact, uh, the ex-king of Saudi Arabia. Yeah. And obviously Faisal Abad has been... Yeah. The Faisal Abad was after renamed him. after him because yeah. he and came Faisal to... And Faisal Masjid, I'll show you in Islamabad. When we Islamabad go is the biggest, one of the biggest mosques in the world and the biggest in Pakistan, definitely, no? Yeah. Really? Yeah. Mm -hmm. It was made by Shah Faisal. Well, that's, that's a good thing, I think, uh, you know. That, that, was, that, that was an era when... Okay, I'll be very cynical. That was an era when we were all in the Western Bloc 
and it it worked in our favor because we were fighting the soviets and uh, pan islamism and uh, you know al qaeda were mujahideen and freedom fighters oh, and yeah. that was an era when so when the dollars stopped flowing in and they started flowing in for uh, the great lgbt jihad hmm. uh, the tables turned on us and the saudi policy towards pakistan has been one of a, of a very cold sort of policy where they've held over our heads the saudi and uae for example hold over our heads visa policies because a lot of our income national income comes from uh, remittances from uh, the expat community in saudi arabia and the uae in in western europe so that's held over our heads in a diplomatic uh, fashion uh, i think qatar and uh, this this new sort of access is again it's it, it's a very careful we have to play a very you know um, careful game when dealing with iran and and and, and qatar and, and the likes but iran is in our neighborhood afghanistan is in our neighborhood uh, they're never going away physically I and mean, this is this is our geographical reality um what we're hoping is and uh, this is an idea that i talk about a lot on the podcast stanistan is this idea that uh, i think muslim countries need to have soft borders amongst each other and it's particularly achievable in in south and central asia uh in with pak with regards to pakistan iran and afghanistan especially because afghanistan and iran for example with the new taliban regime they have developed a train network that connects kabul to tehran and they're trading even though they had fierce combat during the american occupation Uh, with Iranian backed Shia militias and and the Taliban they've resolved their problems and i think it's time for pakistan to step up to the plate and and resolve its problems as well and hopefully we'll be working on these kinds of uh uh foreign policy issues as well I, do you have any comments with regards to the relationship or do you think that this is maybe anything which which involves unity of muslim countries uh, i'm for it definitely why not i don't see the Look, I mean, look at what the European Union did. The, the the clever thing about the European Union was that they were able to maintain the integrity and sovereignty of individual nations whilst at the same time benefit from the interconnectedness of um, neighboring nations in an economic and even military way. So the more I think the Muslim countries are able to do that, the more they will benefit um from a collective spirit which uh, would make it more unsusceptible to global attack and I, i think there's no problem with that whatsoever or we'll we'll dial back from the geopolitics and we'll get back into the into your fields of uh, inquiry uh, polemics uh, the debates with the atheists the agnostics the christians and the, the jews and the like and mm-hmm. um, you've had your fair share as well as as well as ya bhai um How successful do you think this has been as a method of uh, of dawa as a, as a as a method to is it for the public consumption of the muslim population or do you think it's it's more successful in helping convert new communities to islam what 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 is the actual end goal so for me i would say um, the end i mean i mean we don't engage so much in debates but what we do is that we create a narrative and then if somebody anybody from any political affiliation any a background whatsoever if they are kind of clo- kind of crossing that boundary that ideological boundary uh we may name them uh if the, it's a bigger problem and sometimes we don't even name them we just say somebody talked about this particular idea and we think it's flawed because of this because we know that this idea is now hitting the same target audience that we're targeting so for example if there's a new idea that's um catching on with the youth and we know that this is completely anti-islamic or against what we're now teaching to the youth then we'll go ahead and deal with it and if we realize that it's uh the the person or the entity or they're big enough that now they're very popular then sometimes we'll name them otherwise we don't even name people we just go with the flow and we just say this is the idea so i think we're not so much into uh debating as we are into just setting our own narrative and then bringing also a counter narrative to a very predominant narrative that might already be existing Uh, amongst the youth as for us i mean we've been doing lots of debates um i do think it's effective however i think there are more effective strategies for example um we were just talking before about uh, you know media and drama and entertainment and i think now the age of entertainment and the attention spans of people uh, we need to be able to produce effectively serv- goods and services that are more tailored to that kind of thing there was something similar to a muslim netflix i'm i'm completely skipping on the name 
uh it's been operating out of america or canada i think do you guys know the name all right i'll i'll check up later and i'll, I'll yeah but i think just point. engaging in that and like for example cartoons like animations for kids that's something we need to do um dramas and acting in an islamic manner which yeah there's always going to be gray areas and differences of opinion there, there, there's a big there's a big i think uh the model exists and i think turkey had yes. uh, had a very uh, leading um, example in this case because i think uh, successfully Qatar tried it with NBC. You saw the Omar series, and yes. you saw the one about Imam Ahmed ibn Hanbal and and other religious and historic uh, mm-hmm. uh, timelines that they covered with 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 varying amounts of success. I think the Turkish model has been more successful, yeah. where they've taken the existing infrastructure of their soap industry, so the mm. you know soap dramas and you know like these um, afternoon dramas that where women watch in the homes, and they've given them sort of a, a, a Turkish nation, Turk nationalism, historical and religious sort of. uh coloring with 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 the, the the establishment of the ottoman empire and the history of the ottoman empires and al parsalan and yeah. one was particularly popular in pakistan much to the chagrin of the liberals arturul arturul yeah arturul ghazi was a particularly popular uh, uh television drama which the pakistani state by the way had translated officially and and dubbed and provided in uh, pakistan it was the pti government if yeah, i'm not wrong it, it was yeah i think imran khan was a self stylized arturul himself yeah right? Um, what do you think the model is going to be in the UK? If you want to create media content, let's say animations and cartoons, right? You have the resources. You have a lot of Muslim people working for Disney and Pixar and all these and the like. You just need to provide a platform for them to come animate and and develop these stories. But the the larger narrative building, uh, do we have the human resources to do the scores, to develop the music, to develop the storylines? Because it's not easy stuff. Like, do you think? Do you guys have you started working on this? Have you started working in any direction? We have, and I think we've got all the resources for that. And you'd be surprised at what you can do with the budget. Uh, but that's something we'll announce later on. But it's certainly I think, the trajectory that we need to be going on. Because if we don't, then we're not going to be competitive enough. I think uh, is anime a good roadmap? Don't you think for as a Japanese cultural export? I think all over the world, and then even K-pop and and Korean drama. Yeah, I'm not really into anime. So I don't, I've never watched one in my life. I think I watched half of one of them, but I think that yes, I can tell you, you're, yeah. not, you're not autistic. <laughs> <laughs> if if um, someone has good knowledge about that and how to do it and stuff, and they were able to take what's good from that and make it something, Islamize it effectively. Why not? Uh, because I think that anime is a good model. Because historically, I think the the narrative that that the Japanese have built of using anime as a cultural export is 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 I think is of paramount importance. Because there is no great Muslim cultural export at this point. Um, mm. I was speaking the other day with a friend, and he had been reading up the life of Sayyidina Khalid ibn Walid, and he was like, "This is nuts." He was genuinely like shocked by the level of detail and the intricacies of of, of his battle tactics and and the history of his uh, his military conquest. He said we haven't been able to. I think post a post in in a post industrial society, Muslims have not enjoyed uh, a fair amount of the the cultural zeitgeist in terms of literature and film and art. Don't you think this was a big failure? Because this is a big big yeah, debate huge, in Pakistan. In Pakistan, this is a big debate. music is haram tv is haram film is haram drama is haram cartoons are haram and this sort of attitude has and in terms of private consumption everybody is doing it and what it has done it is it has taken all the the applied arts and it is put it in the lap of the more ostracized uh, liberal segments of pakistani society is this true across the muslim world by the way is an egyptian is this the experience yeah i think traditionalist muslims haven't engaged with this uh, as much there was there was a film called the message which was classic yeah it was a classic film that's probably the only thing we have to our credit in the <laughs> muslim are, are, umar series was pretty great umar series yeah but, great. but message was mainstream but I you mean, know this like so the, okay this is okay the that wasn't that wasn't endorsed i think by a few Gaddafi. islamic no, bodies no, no. gadafi gadafi had organized that and the lion of the desert yeah. and they were filmed in libya and financed by uh, the late great uh, yarhamullah by the late by the late great uh, mamar al gaddafi um, but like if you look at the omar series for example I, I, this is very funny it's a very weird uh, sort of culture i watched the first episode and when i saw the stature of omar in that being depicted i didn't want to watch the rest of it because i knew that omar didn't look anything like that actor yeah but i from what i've heard is 
millions of pounds have been poured into that series. I think yeah. I don't know, it was over a hundred million dollars. It was it was a lot of money. It was yeah. a lot of four hundred something million reals or, or really? whatever the Qatari yeah. currency is. Uh, if you look at the Omer series, and this is exactly it's a cultural nitpick that I'm about to do. Mm-hmm. If you look at the because Mustafa Akkad was a Hollywood director, the message has you know even though it's completely historically all over the place, it's a complete nightmare, but it's a film. And when you look at the Omar series, it's like very ham-fisted, uh, sort uh, of very uh, heavy-handed. Uh, Mustafa Aqad, who's, who's this? Mustafa Aqad was a film director. You know the Halloween film uh, where there's a murderer who wears the Halloween mask? It was a f- famous slash. Oh, movie. is he the one who done the message? He was the one who done the message and the Lion of the Desert, the Omar Mukhtar Oh, movie. yeah, 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 yeah. Because, and then unfortunately he died in Lebanon in, in, a, in, a, in a bomb blast, in a suicide blast, uh, oh. I, I, ironically. Wow. He's, uh, he's Lebanese. He, I think he was uh, Lebanese. Okay. Lebanese American, and he was a film director, and he had worked in Hollywood. So he he had he had exported those skills to something that was maybe more. So now we now we're talking. Now this is what we need to do, right? Yes, that's what I'm talking. This is what I'm saying. If you look at the Omar series and mm. you compare it to the message, the, the 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 level of production value, the way it's filmed, the way it's scripted, you can tell that this is a Hollywood style production. And this is something that the Middle Eastern Broadcasting Company did. So there is there's a tendency. I agree with that. By in the, the way. Yeah, so there's a tendency in the Muslim world to uh, just throw material resources at, at this thing. Mm. It's not just money. And this is where I would disagree classically with the stuff that maybe the youth club does. I think that the liberal segment of Pakistani society needs to be won back. And the way to win them back is to provide them avenues to exercise their artistic, let's say, their artistic endeavors in and generalize them in the way that Turkey has done. Again, for me, personal consumption wise, Turkey, the dramas that they produce, very ham fisted, very awkward, sort of, I don't find them to be very inspiring. Well, I find them very goofy, in fact. Well, it's all them, like. Yeah, it's mad, it's mad goofy. Uh, but like the women like it, I feel like young people like it. Whatever, it's not it's not my it's not my cup of tea. But you know, I think the the young people from Pakistani society that have worked in the film industry, both the local as well as the international, in 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 animation, in cartoon mm-hmm. production, in music, in, in in all of these fields of applied arts, they need to be won back and given creative license to produce. Uh, and to, to reintroduce, in fact, the historical narrative that Islam has to give, uh, not just in terms of historical documentaries or films. Or, so I, I think that we run the risk, especially with your your aggressive style of debates. Like it works in the in the Western world because again you're you're you know you're completely surrounded by non-Muslims and you know you're you're not fully British or fully you know anglicized and you know there's a bit of a cultural disconnect with them and, and a cognitive dissonance that that the Muslim in the UK experiences, but the liberal in Pakistan, you know, they're Muslim, right? They go to the Juma. <laughs> the worst of them, maybe they're having some struggle with their beliefs, sure. you know, maybe they're having some trouble with the tradition, maybe reconciling uh, a lot of the Hadith tradition or a lot of the Sira with, with modernity, with their sort of modern conceptions of women's rights or, or the way states ought to work or with violence or whatever, 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 you know, mm. LGBT problem that they're having. Uh, but I think it would be a waste and it would be a miss if we did not, we were not able to salvage that segment of society. So what one thing you, I would say that we are actually uh, behind the scene working on something like that. We've done a few short films. And one thing that I do acknowledge and I understand that, you know, Hollywood has had a far bigger impact on our lives than um, Japanese, for example, culture, because we still don't have Japanese restaurants or we, Hollywood has played a huge role. And one of the reasons why I would say is that because they have their messaging, which is secondary, and the story comes first. Yes. Mm -hmm. So a lot Mm -hmm. of the, for example, um, when you find uh, Islamic content that's created, right? Yes. They put the messaging first and the story is almost nowhere to be found. So it becomes quite comical because, you know, you have people talking almost like robots and, you know, just telling what to do and what not to do. I I think you're referring to the short films that the Madni channel makes. (laughs) Actually, it's it's pretty much across the board. It's it's, it's very... uh, Zainab ke papa. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) (laughs) Ami, Ami, I have done this work. Good, good, good. Something along those lines, right? Right. So the thing is, uh, we have to be be subtle about these things. Again, it's about, you know, uh, you know that... uh, that young overzealous guy who wants to make a change very quickly, he says, you know, put everything in one movie and do it right now. 
because everybody has to accept Islam right after they finish the movie. They should say Ashhadu Allah ilaha illallah. But it's not going to work like that because Hollywood didn't do it that way. They did it very, very slowly. Oh. They introduced very small concepts, but the storyline was huge. And again, no, even now, by the way, there's yeah. a there's a there's a saying in in in, on, on, Show it in, the, tradis, in the Buddhist sphere: yeah. Go woke, go broke. Right. The, no, of, this, the, the, the famous yeah. saying in the arts is, uh, it's a show it, don't tell it principle. Well, it's a more sophisticated, I'm, I'm a much more un uncouth, savage, online sort of <laughs> troll farm. So online, what the, what the young people say is go woke, go broke. So whenever a piece of media content, let's mm. say, uh, let's look at the He-Man cartoons. We all, we all grew up watching He-Man, yes? Yeah. Did mm. you, was that an experience for uh, you? Not really, no. So He-Man, we yeah. remember STN, you know, yeah. He-Man was a classic in Pakistan, by sure. the way. Uh, and they did they redid the He Man, and uh, I think he gets killed in the first episode or something, and then his daughter or some girl <laughs> then takes up the you know she's a Mary Sue kind of character, and she comes up and she sort of I can do it myself, I'm a woman, and you know when they are ham fisted with the woke messaging, yeah, they're gone, they're gone. She Hulk yeah. is gone. Mm. Halas, Marvel is dead. Disney Ghostbusters, is dead. I don't know that girl version of Ghostbusters. It's gone. It's nuts. Yeah. Who, who's the the first Ghostbusters is an absolute class. Was that an experience for you in the UK or no? What? what the Ghostbusters movie, the first one? I watched it, but I wasn't that. Uh, I was nineties, so not eighties. I think Ghostbusters came out in the eighties, right? Yeah, but still, yeah, I but mean, still, it's a classic. The, the, I, okay, so you, you I remember watching. So it. you were in the okay. <laughs> no, so, I did watch okay. it. Yeah. So in Pakistan, because of technology lag, yeah. before the before the internet, everything came ten years later. Ten years later. All oh, right. So after the internet, now we're on 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 one to one level with with so Ghostbusters. What's the question about that? So they remade the Ghostbusters with women. So even when they're oh, they? they, yeah. when recently, they're, recently mm. when they're ham fisted with their messaging, with woke messaging or LGBT messaging, even Western audiences don't yeah, like the it. Hulk, the female Hulk, the she Hulk. Yani. Mm. So this, this thing is, uh, Zavai, I think it's more than just story forward and messaging, uh, you know, more subtle. I think it's that we don't have an experience with, 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 with literature, with film. Yeah. I don't think we don't have a hands on culture with these sorts of, yeah. uh, because unfortunately, the stage plays, isko, in Urdu we call them Natak, isko kehte hai. stage plays were the actual culture of the subcontinent and so was Qawali, which is a kind of Sufi uh, Riyaz or mm. music or Sama. It's a kind of, um, it's very loud, it's very noisy. Uh, it's a kind of uh, vocalization that has developed in the Mughal courts. Uh, because those traditions were generally not accepted as a part of the the cultural zeitgeist in the civil society, partly due to the anglicize, anglicization of Pakistan, and as well as the, the religious community rejecting these forms of arts and expressions. So we didn't develop an organic media tradition. Yes. Because media tradition came from stage plays and from literature and then translated over into film and TV. And you know, so you can't, you can't, uh, uh, you can't force uh, produce, you know, great films and music yeah, and sure. art because you want to do some messaging. It's going to take a while. You would have to develop a culture for the arts, for architecture, for design, you know, aesthetics and literature. And, and So again, going back to, it almost seems like we're in a, we're stuck in a, stuck in a loop. Uh, the humanities, the liberal arts, the applied arts, they haven't been developed. What work have you in mind to develop these arts in a Muslim paradigm, even is there even a way to develop them in an Islamic paradigm? And what do, guys, what do you guys think, Youth Club or Sapiens? I mean, the floor is yours. So we've been, uh, so the only constant with Youth Club is I think change. We're constantly evolving and changing. We do realize that the youngsters or the or the or our target audience, as a matter of fact, uh, has trends changing all the time. So you have one point in time where podcasts are super popular and then you have short uh, clips and then you have maybe lecture style content and so th so there's a market for everything so i think we need to be everywhere and i think there's a huge gap with media so for example if you look at uh, statistics on youtube for example for pakistani dramas you will find viewership in the millions for each drama episode so that leads us to ask the question that why cannot we be in that space whereby we create quality content again which is um, well researched uh, well produced well thought of good storyline uh, using uh, the latest whatever techniques we can and so creating that content so, so i think sapiens is doing something similar we're doing something similar i think uh, kasaram rajabhai is also working on something so i think organically it will evolve into something bigger 
initially of course we're going to have our little hiccups and problems and and what not but inshallah i think uh, we're trying to employ people from the industry by the way mm. so we we're, we're not just study looking at like molvis to come in we're looking at people who are experts in the industry no, we don't need to reinvent the wheel no no we don't because the wheel exists. we, we yeah. have very good script writers in pakistan we have we very good directors we have very good producers we have very good people in great cameras actors and actresses actors and actresses yeah. and all that and and i and i think you know when we talk about taun al albirri wa taqwa we can get a lot of these people on board and inshallah. we can inshallah produce very good content uh, i remember the times of you know the dramas of ashfaq ahmed saab when you know a- any person you talk to right now who has seen that era and who is looking at the era now they will tell you how quality what quality dramas did for the community for the family for your own you know psychological development and all that so i, so I think there's a huge room for that and uh, we're definitely exploring it It, my question to you would be an extension of this into it is the practical and what steps is sapiens taking to enter into the media space <coughs> of uh, content uh, film tv cartoons otherwise this would be the practical concern the principal question is that uh, the basis for all of this is a society which has a significant amount of free expression and free thought which is the link to the whole free speech argument and free speech debate this two restrictions in terms in my mind at least that 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 islam puts on the, on the muslim on the muslim man and woman the on the one end is 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 a is a is, a, is not just a, is not a critique but more of a of 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 a, of a ridicule of religion and religious ideals and characters and individuals and on the other end would be sexual decency how would you reconcile this in the filmed the way where you have live in the what would you call it live action in the more live action content yeah. with, with with films and dramas and how do you reconcile this because uh, in live action uh, so religious criticism sure we can avoid and we can you know we can we can work our way around that aspect of the freedom of speech uh, but between the interplay and the relationship between the sexes when displaying it on tv it's it's a problem between the medium of writing this is a medium problem as well between the medium of writing and then the between the medium of uh, representing that on tv and this is a difference between even cartoons and animations and actually having people act out uh, the relationships between men and women how do you cuz you can't have everybody in a hijab for example mm. this is a big problem uh, i have no idea how to reconcile this because the individual actors piety and their taqwa is also dependent on this and and how religiously they want to participate and and then the depiction of society as a whole it's not everybody's not in a hijab all men don't have beards men women interact in yeah. in, in in manners that are haram how do we express the the social conditions and reflect the actual narrative that exists in society without breaching the laws of allah <coughs> so you on the, on issues like this you're going to get difference of opinion among scholars and this is really an issue of ishtihad so i wouldn't be able to tell you from myself okay this is that or the other but i know for a fact having interaction with high caliber scholars on issues like this that there's going to be a range of different opinions and if we if we take the more staunch opinions and any of this stuff is out of the question so oh. if you take a more pragmatic approach the like of which has already had precedent for example we mentioned the message right so if you look in the beginning of the message you'll see that it's i don't know if lazhar itself which is the most prestigious islamic institute in the world whether they themselves gave the uh, kind of or clear or if it was another body but there were bodies of scholars who did it, in fact uh, sanction uh, and legitimize these particular productions that happened in the past and these were high caliber scholars uh, now the issue of for example al ikhtilat that you mentioned i'll be honest with you this is a contentious issue and there are different opinions among the scholars of how this actualizes on in the real world there's no d- doubt about that um so for example one could say there's two issues here that really from a fiqhi perspective need to be attended to one of them is mas'alat al-ikhtilat or the issue of free mixing what is it and uh, where does it start what does it end what are the exceptions of it what are the you know solutions for it uh and then the other issue is the issue of um aurat looking at a woman with, uh, you've kind of alluded to that already and maybe a subsidiary issue or third issue would be the issue of music but then there are kind of solutions for that the work arounds yeah work arounds for that one yeah the, like for example the acoustic uh, the rock theme yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> sure so we'll start with the first one the, the first one of al-ikhtilat the issue of ikhtilat what is ikhtilat and 
Where does it start? Where does it end? You'll see that there is a variety of opinion among scholars in this issue. Some people take a very staunch view as to how it's actualized in reality, but we know that there were definitely times at the time of the Prophet Muhammad where he interacted with women in the same space in the same time. Um, for example, uh, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent down, قَدْ سَمِعَ اللَّهُ قَوْلَ تُجَادُلُكَ فِي زَوْجِهَا وَتَشْتَكِي إِلَى اللَّهِ In chapter 58 of the Quran, uh, Aisha said that she, she heard the Prophet ﷺ speaking to another woman and they were in a tight, confined space. Now, if a Mulvi, I don't know, does that in, the, in Pakistan, maybe that will be frowned upon, but the Prophet ﷺ done that. And there were other examples of him going into the marketplace and people interacting in a free kind of manner. Uh, so some scholars have a much more lenient view on the, on the matter. And I've spoken to, for example, uh, Sheikh, or through uh, his students and others, uh, Sheikh Adel Shankiti on this issue, and it seems to me, and also through his public already posted fatwas on the issue, that he doesn't see a problem in a man and a woman, for example, being in close proximity with one another, so long as there's no shahwa and there's no fitna and there's no khalwa. And so the scholars like him, who are considered to be traditionalists, for example, would take a more lenient view on the issue. But if you went to, for example, I don't know, some other scholars and um, maybe parts of the world, they will tell you, no, this is, it has to be complete division and all the kind of things. So that's the issue of Qtilat. So that's one thing. The other thing is the issue of, for instance, looking at a woman's hair or looking at a woman's face. Or look. So classically, frankly, scholars have divided the ruling between Muslims and non-Muslims. Now, in the form of Dahib, in all form of Dahib, the, the classical opinion is that looking at a woman's hair or her aura is haram. However, I have come across uh, sayings from uh, notable members of the Salaf who actually uh, did not apply the same ruling to non-Muslim women. Like, for example, Hassan al-Basri, who is a massive scholar of the Ummah. Um, uh, he, uh, he was asked about that. Uh, Imam Ahmad himself, because the thing is, a lot of scholars of today, they, they have a ruling. And the ruling is as follows. They say, if you consider the slave girls or the indentured servants of the past, their hair was showing, okay? And they say, well, if their hair was showing, what's the illah of tahrim? What's the reason why it's haram to look at a woman's hair? Is it because of shahwa? If it, 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 is it, because everyone says if there's shahwa, in other words, if there's someone's feeling some kind of desire, then it's haram. However, it wasn't just the fact that, okay, a woman has to cover. So if, because the horra would cover and the amma would not cover, for example. So some scholars, for example, free, free, so to clarify for the audience, free women would cover and then slave women yeah, would, would not, not cover. cover. Yeah. And so for instance, some scholars like Adedo as well, once again, and his fetters online, I'm giving you an example. It could be said to be aberrational, et cetera. He said the same thing could be said of the non-Muslim women. And as I've said, although it's not represented in the Mu'tabar or if you like the Muftabihi type opinions in the form of Ahab, I have seen a quell of the Salaf which amount to the same kind of thing, which is that the non-Muslim woman looking at her, if it's without shahwa, okay, if it's without shahwa, then it's okay to look at her so, so long as there's some kind of something to be done with that. So the issue is now, these opinions exist in Islam. There is a, not principle, but something to be said in Usul al-Fiqh called Ma'amat bihi al-Balwa. Ma'amat bihi al-Balwa is a kind of, if you like, principle which indicates that if something is so widespread that it's so hard to avoid, then people, you know, Mbab al-Maslaha or darura or whatever you like, communal benefit or whatever, can do it. Now, it's not my job as a non-Mujtahid to tell you when to do that. But all we need to do is to look at the mujtahids and get fatwa. So long as we are following some scholars' opinions, then we can say, la, la, la in kafir masail khilaf. There's no blame on issues of khilaf. So that's one way of uh, dealing with the matter. Uh, the issue of that. And you'll be surprised as this whole ma'amad bihil balwa, for example, how far we take this. Already we take, we use it. All the time. So let me give you an example, right? The example of if some kind of fluid comes out of the vagina of a woman, non-sexual fluid, all form of ahib effectively say that she has to do wudu again. Some woman fluid keeps coming out, keeps coming out, and is she going to continually do wudu? No. Ibn Hazm had the view that she only has to do wudu once. That's one aberrational scholar outside the four schools. And the scholars of Islam, a lot of them use the qaida or the principle of Muhammad bihil balwa to say, well, it's a bit too difficult for people nowadays, therefore they should do it. 
whether or not they should be doing the same thing. And you, you put it rightly, probably in the beginning when you said that if you did a survey and you saw and you asked the Muslim world, how many of you are participating in watching Netflix series or any kind of series? Potentially, it would be a massive number, monu- like maybe 85, 95% of people watching movies and, and, and series. So this, the question would be, and I'm not, you know, who am I? But the question I would put to the Mujtahid is, has this reached the threshold of Muhammad bihil Belwa? And if so, then we, we should be able to offer solutions and alternatives. If people are already addicted to series and movies and, and, and shows and so on, then should we not be able to produce something which would grab their attention, something, which, something can, which can be competitive, but which to the best of our ability, you know, is in line with the Islamic morals. And already films and series meet criteria like that. There are films in the IMDb top 100 and top 250, which don't have any women at all in them. For example, 12 Angry Men. Yeah, are, we're talking about that's that, yeah, number six or some, seven on, in mm. the, on the ranking. And that's not one woman main character, for example, in there. There no country for old men. It's a man going through the thing. There's no woman in there at all. Rambo 3, for example, dedicated to the gallant people of Afghanistan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, there will be blood. Yeah, yeah, that's the one I think. But so there's a lot of films like that already. But I'm saying that it might be difficult to say, okay, we're going to eliminate the female aspect of it. It's, so it's no, really impossible. It's not almost. difficult to say. It would be impossible and it would be a detriment to Muslim Yeah, society. yeah, sure. So what, I'm, so what I'm saying is that still you can find creative loopholes. Yeah, and so right. Some people would want to, f- to take it this far. Some people would take I don't it know if far. I want to watch cartoons without eyes. No, no, no. Yeah, no, no. I think that's an that's that's easier that's issue to solve. That's, in fact, that issue is majority opinion is that if it's for children, and you, can, you can have the toys, toys and things like that. Okay, fine. But anime yeah. is universally enjoyed by adults as well. You can you can blame that to autism. You can blame that to whatever. Yes. But anime has. No, no, I mean, yeah. That's fine. No problem. I, these things you can find. There's work around. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So it's the, the idea is that surely it's now a, we have a, to be more pragmatic with this issue because mm-hmm. if we're not being pragmatic, we're going to be drowned. And that's what this is an ideological warfare. We're going to be. I think we're already drowning. being drowned. Yes. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's going to get worse. It's, so okay. So there is a way. Islam is like water, it's going to find its way, it's going to, sometimes it's going to cut through the rock, sometimes it's going to avoid the path. Okay, we're going to find a way to reconcile the medium, because it is a medium problem, because you could do all this in literature, and maybe in, 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 in poetry and prose, you could have done this, you could have talked about the more vulgar aspects of human society and still get away with it. But the medium of uh, the audiovisual is one where the one who is producing it, the one who is viewing it, the one who is distributing it, it becomes a bit of a problem in terms of the 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 haram or halal status of what they're doing. A lot of people will not. So, okay, so you've set it up, you're willing to do it. Now think about it as an industry. Do you think the traditional Muslim who will want to get hands on involved with such an endeavor would they want to profit from this? A lot of people wouldn't consider this as halal income or as something that's worthwhile or worth financing. Cartoons, maybe, but that's not the real, you know, that's not the, that's not where the, where, where it's at. The actual young 30, 35 year old is, 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 is chronically online watching these TV shows and, and what have you. They're not all going to watch podcasts. You know, you can't keep yeah, them, for sure, for you sure. can't make them watch podcasts they all watch the time. Both, maybe. Yeah. They all watch both. Mm. They can't be listening to khutbat all the time and reading the Quran and reading you know, books of fiqh and hadith and seerah and, mm. and what have you. There is So universally it is accepted that fantasy literature, children are going to read it. Mm. Muslim kids, religious kids, irreligious kids, whatever. Yeah. Everybody yeah. is. Yeah. The next step, so the traditionalists would be like, ah, you uh, you know, with every step you're repealing the, the, the chains and links of Islam and this would be the next step towards our disaster, right? They always have some sort of um, a rosy-eyed view of the past and, and then they, they, they hate change and then they hate, they're very rigid to it, which is, you know, was good during colonialism, but now we're free of it, more or less. Do you think there would be an acceptance rate, like a high uptake in the Muslim community? Because the Umar series faced a lot of this, by the way, mm. that people didn't like that the Sahabiyat. No, no that's, that had more issues because they were depicting the Sahabis. Like the Sahaba and Sahabiyat. So there was another aspect of complication there. But now if you remove that, like look at the message itself, you know, they, they almost depicted the Prophet. I mean, they didn't fully, but that was, these are layers of complication. But nevertheless, the point is this precedent because they, these were endorsed by scholars of Islam. They were endorsed. Do you think that there's a batch of scholarship that understands across the Muslim world 
that it understands the the need of the hour right now yeah. and do you think do you think do you think the time is right yeah so what is this and i think we're at we're at, we're at the end this podcast is finished <laughs> and uh, uh what do you think going forward with your media strategies with the content you want to produce with the work that you want to do you want to work with lobbying and legislation what is the future for the youth club and for the sapiens institute inshallah sapiens go first well i mean it's, it, because we are a an organization that is has a very specific strategic focus and we take donations from the public so we wouldn't be able to do anything really without um effectively telling or announcing to the public this is what we're using your money for and without the ex- express consent and uh, um, you know if you like declaration from our CEO who is Hamza Zorsis he t- he usually sets the ag- agenda on these things so when we talk about movies and media and all these kind of things that's not necessarily to be funded by the public if you like this is things that for now uh, we're finding you know p- private funding for for that um we need to show proof of concept first before mm. then a pub, the public audience or whoever else could say okay this works let's do it uh we need to prove ourselves we need to see if it works so these are all ideas that we have in the pipeline uh we're going to try them out and see how it works but it always starts with <coughs> dipping your, your feet into the water and seeing how things work trial and error and you might want to try something two or three times before you conclude it doesn't work f- or at least it doesn't work for me or for us maybe we should leave it or you know subcontract it or to leave it off to somebody else to do so we are we're still in the kind of experimental phase we'll see how it goes but certainly in the next couple of years there's going to be some products that all of us are going to be exposed to that you can we can all see if it works or not inshallah no i'm going to be holding out for the sapiens cartoons uh, that would be that would be great uh, input i think right now in the, the current uh, climate zia bhai what do you think uh, your club is going to do going forward um given the name of youth club we're always going to be where the youth are so Inshallah. our our strategy is constantly evolving and changing as per the times so for example if you say right now the youth are on instagram and maybe just a dying population on facebook maybe tomorrow there's a new platform so wherever they are we'll be there uh, providing content providing uh, the type of content that's relevant to the youth for example if it's reels if it's short videos if it's uh, short films if it's uh, uh you know podcast for example whatever it is will be there inshallah and most importantly we're in schools we're in colleges we're in universities uh we're in the streets we're doing programs we're doing year long programs we're doing uh, six month programs we're doing weekend courses so all of these platforms we're providing youth with opportunities we do uh, wilderness retreats we take them to excursions and things like that um so there's a lot of fun and games we have uh, game on events we have masjid lock up events so yeah, what we yeah. So what we're trying to do is uh, create this environment or this community where youth can engage in whatever appeals to their sensibilities whatever they like whatever they enjoy and we do it in a fun and relatable manner and through this what we're trying to do is we're trying to uh, bust images you know the image of what is a molvi for example so we're trying to change that narrative that you know normally traditionally uh, from that liberal high ground it would look like a molvi or for example a religious person is somebody who is uh not educated about the worldly affairs who is um you know backward whatever um so that type of narrative we're now trying to change so that basically becoming molvi becomes something that's cool something that people want to be something that youngsters say i i mean i would love it and i and i every time i hear this uh it it makes me emotional when a young boy or girl says that you know i when i grow up i want to be a quote unquote molvi not like a traditional sense but i want to learn whatever i want to learn for example the sciences or <clears throat> uh, whatever it might be but at the same time molvi means basically i want to connect with allah subhanahu wa taala i want to become a practicing muslim so i think that's what we're all about and that's what you, we're doing youth club making molvi school again all right and yes uh, molvi with an attitude molvi with an attitude Hence, sorry yeah that's the that's the the molvi with an attitude yeah. <laughs> uh molvi with an attitude with the uh, a debater with the attitude uh thank you boys uh thank you guys for coming in jazakallah khair uh sorry for the disjointed conversation but uh i think uh, the significant portion of the conversation happened before the podcast it's been emotional all right thank you very much assalam alaikum